to um, kick off, first of all, formally with acknowledging, celebrating and paying our respects to the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people of the Canberra region and to all First Nations on whose traditional lands uh, we may be meeting or dialling in from today. And we pay our respects to Elders past, present and emerging and any of you who might be in the room or um, joining us um, today. So over these next two days, we're coming together to, um, as people across a broad range of disciplines um, to communicate and promote approaches um, for vocabularies that can be used to enhance and enrich data and the meaning of data, information and knowledge so that data can be shared, reused appropriately into perpetuity. <laughs> That's a big word, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so we're working with um, vocabularies to in, enhance the meaning of data, information and knowledge. So I think um, with that, it's um, it's only really appropriate that we um, pay our deep respect to the fact that we're meeting on the lands of the um, oldest continuing culture and um, knowledge system in human history today. So um, with that, I'd like to hand over to Paul House from the Australian National University. Um, First Nations portfolio. Thank you very much. Amandangu, Wurugu Wuri Megan. Thank you, Megan. And Jumburuburu Marambang and Naramarang Maranya. Good morning, everyone. Baladu, Nyambri, Cambri, Wogalu, Wallabaloa, Waradri, Nyang. I speak all the languages here on country Nyambri, Cambri, Wogalu, Wallabaloa, Nunuwa, Waradri. So, Ilingalangbu, Yundu Paul Girawa House. My name is Paul Girawa House. Nadu Marudu Mare Biringu Guji Gangu Nyambri Nuru Nurumbango. I was born here, the centre of my ancestral country, at the Old Canberra Hospital. Anyone born in the Old Canberra Hospital? I must, I must be an endangered species, am I? No. It's good to see hospital alumni, though, and I do a welcome to country. Uh, so. Uh, Nyambri, Yilingalangbu, Gibabungu, Wugabu, Migebu, Diranilbang, mate. Ladies and gentlemen, young men, young women, distinguished guests, Nyari and Jamali, Nyambri, Guma, Wogalu, Wallabalawa, Nunawa, Nagariga, Waradri, Mujigang, Yangarambu, Joyandu, my respect to Nyambri, Cambri, Wogalu, Wallabalawa, Nunawa, Waradri, elders past and present. Nyari and Jamarabu, Mujigangu, Nurumbanjigu, Ninya Yiridu, my respects to all people from all parts of the country, First Nation people. Nyambri, Cambri, Wogalu, Wallabalawa, and Nunawa, Mayinga, and Banya, Ninyoga, Nurumbangaldara, Nyambri, Cambri, Wogalu, Wallabalawa, people, welcome you all to country. Marambang, Marambang, Nyang, Yambuan, fair vocabularies for all. Uh, Young in language. It's not on there at the moment. They get your conference theme. Nadu Wudagabigi Balabambo Gubu Balagi Bangu Bugungulila Dumbalina Murway Marambo. We listen to the old people, the ancestors, the elders, and they show us the good path, the right path, the straight path. Uh Dulagang Muru, straight path. Going Gulila Bilangalina Yama Malina Walla Malinao. They nurture us, they guide us, they protect us. Our old people, our elders, our ancestors. Mambawara Naminyagu, Wuragabinya Wura Daraigo, Winningala Gubaligo, looking to see, listening to hear, and learning to understand. Niani Yinjamali, Nurbangila Balanin, Wallawin, Galanga, Bangbo, Yanin Gingo, Niani Mawang Yao Biligi Gila Yamon Bilgiri Yani Marambo Bagarigan Yanin Gingo. We look after country so it is healthy for our children and for all of our people. And we teach and we learn what is what is right for all of us on country. Living a respectful way of life, cares for country. Respect is taking responsibility for the now, the past, the present and the future. Our welcome to countries are always made in the spirit of peace and a desire for harmony for all people of modern Australia. And our main aim always to establish an atmosphere of mutual respect through the acknowledgement of our ancestors and the recognition of our rights to declare our special place in the pre and post history 
of the Canberra region, the name Canberra, is derived from the name of our people and country right here at the ANU. Uh, Nyambri, Namburu, Nyambri, Canberra, Canberra. Uh, gazetted on the 22nd of January, 1834, here, uh, Canberra Station, under the New South Wales colonial government. Uh, we've cared for Mother Earth since the dawn of time. And evidence of our occupation, our statehood, our sovereignty can be seen everywhere throughout the land. Our signature is in the land, not just our DNA. And taking care of country is important to us all. Yinjamal Gijo, Yinjamara Bu, Yinjamali. Anyone heard of those words? Yinjamara. In language, it means many good things. Uh, to go slow, it's a, it's a way of life. Many good things. To go slow, be patient, be polite, be gentle, take responsibility, uphold. Yinjamara, uh, Yinjamara Bala, Bayami, Wallamara, Maramau, Dain, Umbe, Yukumbrak, Yibai, Mulian, respecting our key totems, uh, our creator and protector, Bayami, the crow and the eagle, here on country. Wirai Nyai, Wirai Mayin, Wirai Nyiang, no language, no people. Wallawin Mayin, Wallawin Nurumango. Healthy people, healthy country. Injamara bala bala bidada bina 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 yawilu will wurwin nurumbango respect is in the Cambry Creek and the rivers and the breeze quietly moving through country. Bala walam wanga dabu murun madan dabu bamba yu guru gambira bango nara nara respect is in the grinding stones and the carved trees made long ago on country. Magagiri going guliala magagiri biringa bogongu durunda. Respect is in the journey of the Bogong moths in the mountains. Wonga dai nanu dangawa bu mira daganda wijinga yina wonga da daganda baba yedinigo. Respect is in the soles of the feet of our dancers. It's in how our matriarchs dig for yams in Mother Earth. Maragaladal walan mayan mayangalong hold fast to each other, empower the people. Walangunmala mara mara gurai be brave, make change. Dira yawana muruwara nawan bira. Get up, stand up, and show up. Just in terms of our vocabulary, I'm sharing with you. Burumba bira. Baladu nyiyang burumba bira. Nyane gingyu. I'm sharing this language with you all. Our language is what we describe as a free word order structure. It comes from Mother Earth. Uh, it comes out of the ground. And it's it's created by the old people, uh, Bayami, Gujigang, uh, Nuyalang, the old people, tens of thousands of years ago, and we still uh, speak language, Gari speak, Nyang language on country, because of uh, oral history, but also because of the ethno-historical records, uh, powerful and compelling, and the records taken by non-Aboriginal people when they first come to country. So that's important. Uh, we're able to uh, continue to speak language on country. Language is empowering. Dirung, Dirungo language is important. Dirungo important. Niawe Gunungijo, your identity. Mara uh, Mara, the the actions you take, the nina, the focus, and the way and other the transformation of being able to speak language and express yourself across country. So with that, Injamara uh, Bala. Uh, mara mara nia nia girma maranga respect shapes us and lifts up the people. Mara mara winninga gigalana may in respect creates people who care for each other. So, Guayambana nina nurumbango, welcome to the country. Uh, welcome and mandangu wuragori. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, Paul, did you want to, did you want to set up or you're right? Yeah, you're right. Would I just be able to say a word before you leave? Just th thank you very, very much. And I think um, respect creates um, people who care. Um, I think we need to, we could take a lot of those messages that you expressed there around respect for country, people and each other as we build vocabularies that are respectful and take our time, patience and care with creating them. So 
Thank you very, very much for your time today. We are very pleased to welcome Arafan Gregory um, from Codata today. We're very pleased that he's taking the time out of his busy schedule to join us. So um, Arafan works as a standards expert with Codata at the data arm, that's the data arm of the International Science Council. For more than two decades, he, he's focused on the development and implementation of technical standards for scientific and official data and metadata, contributing to the SDMX, so the Statistical Data and Metadata Exchange, DDI, the Data Documentation Initiative, and GSIM, the Generic Statistical Information Model Specifications, amongst others. He's the chair of the DDI Cross Domain Data Integration Working Group, and he was co chair of the IUSSP Codata Fair Vocab Working Group, IUSSP, the International Union for the Scientific Studies of Population Working Group. He's active in the World Fair Project with a focus on the development of cross -domain, the cross domain interoperability framework, and um, which is a metadata. Um, metadata to support fair data use in multidisciplinary implementations. So today, uh, Gregory, um, will his talk will characterise the metadata landscape and the challenges uh, we face regarding fair controlled vocabularies. So he's asked the question, why, when the technology and standards can so easily solve the problem, do we remain unable to leverage these critical assets? So. Um, we really hope, you know, he'll be ra he's raised this question. We look forward to hearing his thoughts, ideas on this, and it will stimulate an interesting discussion. So hold on to those questions for um, the discussion at the end. So hopefully we have Arafan. I'm here. Can you see my... Can you awesome. see my... Uh presentation we can hear you and we can see your presentation in presentation mode very good um so I'm, so I'm dialing in from from um dublin in ireland uh, this evening to me um i realize it's it's a, a bit earlier for for you tomorrow um i before i get going here i i wanted to just uh, mention something i i know that the i'm going to be talking a lot about fair which is primarily where i work these days you know, in, in implementation of the FAIR principles. Um, I wanted to, to, to mention briefly the CARE principles because I know that's something of, of significance. Um, and I'm going to be using a lot of examples here that are that are sort of Western European examples. And I don't want anyone to think that I'm suggesting that's the primary or, or most important um, sort of uh, set of examples, merely that those are the ones I know best, which is why I've used them. Um, I'm going to be talking today about uh, some perspectives on, on metadata and how controlled vocabularies fit into the metadata landscape that we're dealing with today. Um, I had to ask myself when I was invited to do this talk what I had to offer, because I'm not a, an ontologist, I'm not a subject matter expert, um, I'm not a classification expert. What I am is sort of a, a, a specialist in metadata more broadly. And it seemed to me that positioning controlled vocabularies in relation to metadata was would offer some perspectives some food for thought um to to this group and i hope that i hope you find this useful i'm going to be talking a little bit about understanding the metadata landscape and some ways of thinking about metadata that i found useful talk a little bit about how we organize knowledge the systems we use to organize knowledge um talk a, a bit more about fair and how ontologies sort of fit into that um in, into that equation and then talk about trying not to fail um i think we, we're faced with an opportunity at this point that we can choose to take um but there will be consequences if we don't and i, I sort of want to 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 um start off with a little bit of a whimsical example of that i'm a, a bit of an amateur historian if you will and um so I, I want to give you an example from the from the mid nineteenth century. This is this is a Lord Palmerston, who was the the Prime Minister of the UK from 18, 1835 to eighteen sixty five, maybe something like that. And he had to deal. He he was obviously a huge driver of policy within the the British Empire. 
which was a, a big player in those days globally. And um, there was a kind of nasty situation in northern Germany and southern Denmark, depending on who you talk to. They were having a civil war over Schleswig-Holstein. And he said about this, only three people have ever really understood the Schleswig-Holstein business. The prince consort, who's dead, a German professor who's gone mad, and I, who have forgotten all about it. Now, that's a pretty, pretty a flip thing to say. But um, what we have here is a scenario where no one understood the, the real meat of the matter, the, the merits of the situation. And yet they fought two shooting wars, resulting in 35,000 casualties. And arguably, this contributed to, to the, the lead up to the German Empire that triggered the First World War. So the consequences of a policy failure, and they were really blundering around in their ignorance in this particular issue, was based on a failure of understanding and a tiny number of people who really understood what it was about and who could not communicate that to anyone else. And um, this seems like sort of an irrelevant example, but I, when we look at the policy decisions that, that are important to us today in an age of global warming and a lot of the other challenges we face, and we think about the potential cost of failure, the way we communicate about complex issues is primarily in explaining the data on which policy is based. And I, I kind of wanted to, to, to use this as a cautionary note because if we don't get um, a good mechanism for explaining data, for understanding data around complex issues, bad things can happen. It's not a direct correlation. It's not an automatic consequence, but it opens a possibility and it's a possibility it would be best if we could avoid. So I'm gonna start with this little sort of um, whimsical failure scenario. And, um, and sort of move forward from there. And I'll come back to this at the end. Controlled vocabularies are all about definition of terms. So I thought it would, it would be right and, and good for me to define what I mean when I say controlled vocabulary in this talk. Um, a controlled vocabulary is a formal um, set of terms and definitions, often supplemented with information about the relationships between and among the important things in a domain. And that's a, a, not a, a comprehensive definition, but I think you see where I'm going with this. Practically speaking, I'm talking, yes, about code lists and um, classifications and ontologies, but also thesauri and vocabularies and taxonomies. And there are a number of different forms that control vocabularies can take. But um, I'm using the term in, in a broad sense here. Controlled vocabularies recognize the important distinctions in how we understand uh, any given domain. And I want to point out that when we make those distinctions, we imply the existence of models or systems that are in operation within the domain being described. Think about a system where I have um, people who can either get on a bus because they have a ticket or they can't. So I have two categories of people, ticketed people and unticketed people. That system um, is fine until I say that children ride for free, right? And children mean that I need a third category because I have adults with tickets, adults without tickets, and children. So the capabilities of a system are, are determine what the important uh, distinctions are that we need to make. And there's an inherent connection between the capabilities of, of a system to describe things and the distinctions that need to be made. And the point here is that Controlled vocabularies never exist independent of other considerations. And when we think about metadata, that kind of connection is pretty fundamental. I wanna talk a little bit about perspectives on metadata because it's a very broad topic and a, a very difficult one to get your head around. Um, and this is something that I've learned, I guess the hard way over the past 20 years, which is that it pays dividends to think about metadata at three different levels. And the the, basic level is conceptual. We have information which provides the concepts and ideas and formalizes concepts and ideas that allow us to describe data and other kinds of related resources. And CVs are obviously um, really at home at this level of metadata. CVs provide the building blocks which everything else uses to describe data. We have, however, another level, which I, I, I like to call the logical level where we take the intellectual organization of concepts, the logical relationships between concepts, how they describe data, how they relate to each other. And there are lots of different roles that they play in relation to data. 
They could be variables or categories, properties, universes, populations, all kinds of things that they can do in relation to data. And we need to understand what those roles are and what the logical organization of concepts is, as well as just the definition of the concepts themselves. And below this, of course, we have the physical encoding of metadata. Um, what is the syntax? What is the format? And uh, things that allow it to be consumed and manipulated by computers. Um, all of these levels are always in operation when we talk about metadata of any kind. And there's the levels are very related so that concepts can play many different roles in different logical structures, the same concepts. And those logical structures can be encoded physically in an almost infinite number of ways so that it's important when we're trying to integrate data and manage data that we understand where the agreements are and where the differences are, what's being reused and what's not. So I find this to be a very interesting way to think about metadata, a very useful way to think about metadata. If I had to give you a simple typology of metadata, this would be it. We have definitional metadata, again, CVs, which provide concepts and semantics. We have structural metadata, which talks about the roles played by concepts vis-a-vis -vis the data, vis-a-vis -vis, um, other concepts, and a lot of packaging and higher level information about groups of, of, of data, um, streams of data, files of data, what have you. And then we have what I term provenance and contextual metadata. So data lineage and origination. How was the data collected? Is, was it a survey, a sensor, a register? How was data processed? What were the methods used? What was the purpose for collecting the data? Was it part of an experiment designed to answer a particular research question? Um, was there some other purpose? All of this information is necessary to fully understand data. And controlled vocabularies here are foundational, but they are not alone. They are one type of metadata among many. And a complete set of metadata is necessary when we're talking about really understanding data fully. And um, this is gonna come up again and again, because I feel like it's an important point. Um, I do see controlled vocabularies as a very, a very foundational form of metadata, but by, in and of themselves, they cannot do everything. When, when I look around the world today, I see a couple of sort of typical uh, scenarios um, when, it, when we talk about metadata. A lot of domains have established standards and systems and technologies for dealing with metadata and managing data, disseminating data, reusing data. Um, and domains in this sense are not necessarily academic disciplines, although that is certainly one uh, primary way that, that domains are organized. When I look at official statistics as an example, I see that as a single domain. You have a whole number of organizations that are, um, they, they perform a common function in terms of providing official data uh, for policy to government, but and they have their own standards that they use to exchange data and they're deeply cross-disciplinary. But that I see as a domain because it's a community of practice. Within these communities, you see differing levels of maturity and very diverse approaches um, to how they deal with data management, with describing data, with managing data and metadata both. And there tends to be a lack of interoperability across domain boundaries. Um, there also tends to be a depth of focus, what we term these days domain fair, which is to say that members of that community can often exchange data and have metadata that is meaningful to everybody within the domain, but not outside of it. And I think that's a very typical case. At the same time, we see a, a culture of standardization that is really organized around the web. And W3C is, I guess, the, the biggest organization. A lot of standards that are webby um, use RDF and other sort of webby technologies to describe very broadly, but not in a lot of depth, um, particular things. So we have standards like PROV that describe provenance in a very general way. Um, but not in a very deep way, not in a very specific way that's meaningful within a particular domain. And emerging from this, we have this idea of cross-domain fair. And I'll come back to that a little bit when I talk more about world fair and some of the things that are coming out of that. But controlled vocabularies exist in kind of a special space vis-a-vis -vis these kinds of standardization because they're inherently domain-specific. And yet, they're a very important kind of metadata to exchange in cross-domain scenarios. And so there's a bit of tension between these very broad, shallow standards and these very deep domain-specific standards. And um, uh, 
controlled vocabularies are, are one of the, the points where that becomes very complicated. And you end up having to map controlled vocabularies across domain boundaries to make them useful. Um, I want to stop there in a discussion of, of a characterization of metadata and switch gears a little bit and talk about how we organize knowledge. And I'm going to take a sort of historical view of this because I think there's a trajectory here that it's worth recognizing. Uh, organizing knowledge is something that people have always done since, I guess, the dawn of time. And there are different ways of doing this. I mean, people used to have oral traditions where they had lists of, of significant figures like king's lists and so on. And that was passed on from generation to generation. Um, and over time, we have more sophisticated systems that have developed. But it does seem to be the case that once a system of organizing knowledge takes hold in human society, it tends to persist basically forever. I'll give you an example of this in a minute. Um, but as new systems come along, they expand our ability to organize knowledge and to leverage knowledge. And that seems to be intricately tied up with the emergence of new technologies that support that expansion. Let me give you an example. Um, I, I don't know if you've ever seen a, a bestiary, but um, I think these things are wonderful. They're, they're books, and this is mostly from the Middle Ages, where people tried to enumerate all of the animals that they were aware of. And so they're effectively lists of animals um, organized maybe alphabetically, maybe not particularly organized at all, but they have these, these uh, descriptions and these uh, wonderful illuminations. You can imagine monks going blind in their, in their monasteries uh, painting these things. And some of the animals turn out to be fictional, like the wyvern and the phoenix and so on. Um, but what you have is a simple listing, and lists are very consonant with the, the experience of, of human experience of the world if you view time in a, in a linear fashion. Now, I recognize that not all, all societies do that. I understand that there are Aboriginal societies where time is nonlinear, but I think that's a bit of a, a, an exception. I think most cultures view, experience the world in linear fashion and think about time as a sequence of things, one thing after another. Lists are, are a sort of natural extension of that into the organization of things that we understand and know. And so even with simple technology, like oral traditions, verbal memorization, you have these lists of things. And today we still use these. We have code lists. And code lists are um, a simple way of organizing knowledge, but they are very prevalent and very useful. I mean, modern code lists are maybe a sophisticated form of list, but they're not unlike the way lists have existed throughout human history. If we dial forward a couple of centuries, we end, we end up with this gentleman, um, Linnaeus who's known as the father of taxonomy. And in, I think, uh, the mid 18th century, 1761, maybe, you know, earlier than that, 58, he published a thing called the Systema Naturae, which is the original classification of, of plants and animals. And this is a leveled hierarchy organized around observable physical similarities. So what we really have here is a list that is made up of lists. And it's a much more complex construction than a simple list. Um, and it takes, a, I think, a little bit of a, a more demanding technology that you need, you need uh, to be literate. It's kind of a file folder paradigm. You need pen and paper at a minimum. Uh, printing press probably helps a lot. Um, and he wasn't the man who invented classifications, but he's maybe the most famous example of this. Um, his taxonomy is still in a, in a much um, uh, evolved form in use today. And classifications are still a very, very common way of organizing knowledge, right? Um, we think about uh, the way computers interact with knowledge, and we have technologies like XML that are fundamentally hierarchical. Lots of, lots of classifications are used very, very widely today. And it, it's, again, a fairly natural way of humans to think about the world and to organize their, their understanding of it. Um, anybody who's worked with classifications, however, will have had the experience where something doesn't fit neatly into a single category, that maybe it sort of also wants to be in another category. And you end up with constructions like C also. And that leads to, I, I guess, the most modern um, example to have here, which is the graph. And the example I'm gonna give you is linked open data. Now graphs are a kind of network of objects that are connected only through their relationships with other objects. And those relationships can be of particular types. Um, now, this is not a natural way to, to understand the world, even though it can be a very powerful way to describe it. 
So um, you really need good technology to make sense of a graph because when you present it to a human being, you're likely to end up with something presented as a list or a hierarchy, in fact, that is de derived by navigating through that graph. You need a lot of, of computation to deal with this model, but it's an incredibly powerful model. And that's why we see it becoming more and more common. Ontologies use graphs as their fundamental organization. Um, and this, there are a lot of reasons for this, but I, I'm going to stop now with, with this sort of example about how we organize knowledge, but we'll, we'll come back to this in a bit. I think this evolution is actually very important as we think about the form the controlled vocabularies take and how best they can be expressed. Um, this gives rise, I think, to some questions. Now, I've been making, um, trying to answer the, the question, what is the point here? We need precise, clear communication of significant distinctions that inform our understanding within domains. And I think that's kind of a given. That's the point of controlled vocabularies. But there's some other questions we kind of need to ask here. Who are we communicating these things to? And what do they do with controlled vocabularies? Why do they need these things to be explained? Um, and if we can answer those questions, what language should we use to do it? Um, and I think, I think those are interesting things to think about. But there's a third question, a little bit unrelated, which is um, different. Why are we so bad at it? Because I would argue that even though we have a lot of, of good approaches to control vocabularies today, we're not doing a very good job of sharing them in a useful way. So I'm going to sort of take these questions uh, one at a time. When I think about who we're communicating control vocabularies to and why we're doing it, I'm not really talking about end users so much as the kind of people who are in the room um, right now, which are people who use these things and to, to serve end users. And I, I really divide this into two groups, and I'm not sure my names for these groups are very good, but the first group I would say are ontologists, people who are looking at shared definitions of the important things within domains. They're looking at very deep, complete descriptions of important objects and how they relate so that you can sort of model the working of domains. The applications you can build with this are often termed reasoners. That is, I can perform sort of a logical reasoning on a domain based on the information I have to describe it. Now, this is an incredibly powerful kind of technology. Um, and you have standards for supporting this, things like OWL, the web ontology language, and then lots of uh, more, more general formal ontologies like BFO and GFO. GIST, which is a little more practical upper ontology, and a whole ton of domain ontologies. So there are lots of standards within this community and lots of powerful technology, but it's very focused within the domain primarily. In, in, uh, alongside them, you have what I describe as the FAIR community, although that's not a great name. These are people who are focused on interoperability. So how can we share definitions across different domains? How can we use them to harmonize data coming from different sources? Um, and really, the main use case here is reuse and integration of data. And they have a different set of standards, things like SCOS, the Simple Knowledge Organization System, XCOS, which is the Extended Knowledge Organization System for doing classifications, things like ESSIM, uh, the Simple Standard for Sharing Ontology Mappings, models like GSIM and Neuchatel, which are dealing with classifications, and so on. Um, so you have some sort of different communities with different focuses and different applications. But I think that these are really the major consumers of controlled vocabularies from, from a technical perspective today, from a metadata perspective. I want to point out that these are not exclusive communities and less and less over time. I feel like FAIR is bringing people from these two groups more and more together as they look at how you can share meanings across domains. So the, the cross-domain FAIR case and the upper ontology case, where you want to organize ontologies into a broader understanding. Both groups are looking now more and more at describing crosswalks. And there's a lot of, of um, a development in that space, even in the past couple of months. And I think that's going to be a, a, an interesting um, development. And, but one thing that both of these groups absolutely recognize is that an important aspect of communicating controlled vocabularies is to machines that we need to have machine actionable descriptions of these things. Because when I turn to the question, what language should we use? There's one thing that everybody seems to agree on, not PDF. Word, Excel, pretty image files, printed manuals, these are all nice for human consumption, but they're no longer sufficient to support the description of controlled vocabularies in the modern world. 
For ontologist, I think OWL is probably the most common format, although there are some other vocabularies like RDFS that get used. Um, and those things are expressed in RDF conformance syntaxes, so Turtle or RDF XML or JSON LD. In the FAIR community, SCOS and XGOS are probably the most common, and they use similar syntaxes, so Turtle or JSON LD or, or RDF XML. Um, I would say the lowest common denominator here is really SCOS or XGOS and triple SOM for mappings um, in those uh, common RDF expressions. Um, and there are some, some approaches to more complex uh, mappings that are kind of under development as we speak. Um, I wanna emphasize here that the granularity of description in these standards is, is, is very important. If you're using SCOS and XGOS, you have to describe things to the level of individual concepts and each node in, in, in a classification or ontology. Because if you describe things to that level in a machine actionable way, even though you might be describing a flat list or a hierarchical construction, you make them able to participate in larger knowledge graphs. And that ability to connect to this more complex form of knowledge organization is really, really important moving into the future. Why are we so bad at it today? Um, this is not a simple topic. And I don't like to just point a finger at the world and say, you're terrible at this, but I kind of have to do that because so many controlled vocabularies today, even of very high importance, are very, very poorly disseminated according to the sort of criteria I'm talking about. Um, one thing I am gonna maintain, however, is that this is not a failure of technology and it's not a failure of standardization. We have good standards for describing controlled vocabularies in a technical way. The things I've been mentioning, SCOS, XGOS, OWL, all of this stuff. And we have good technology platforms and tools for doing it. RDF technologies are really very, very good at this, and they're pretty easy to implement. I mean, SCOS is not a hard thing to implement. It can be done fairly handily. So this isn't a technology failure at all. Um, if people are, are familiar with the 10 simple rules document, and the, the link and the, and the DOI is down at the bottom there. If you're not familiar with that document, please read it. It lays out in a very easy to understand way the main considerations for providing controlled vocabularies in a fair way that is maybe not the best possible way, but provides a good basis for doing it. And this isn't that hard to do. Um, so I'm gonna argue that the failure is really as kind of a failure of maybe organizational awareness. I don't know how to describe this, but I see there being some real problems with how we approach controlled vocabularies. One of these I, I call the data space fallacy, and the other is maybe a, a similar phenomenon around incomplete solutions to data sharing. The data space fallacy is this, uh, and you see a lot of people talk about interoperability as a matter of providing access to existing data and metadata in their current form. So they'll put like Jupyter notebooks and data files and PDFs of controlled vocabularies and documentation into an online space so you can access them at the same time. And they say, ah, interoperability, problem solved. And it's not true because all you've really done is provide access. And although access is a precondition for fair and a precondition for interoperability, it does not solve the entire problem. You still have that the challenge of being able to understand the resources and how they fit together and integrate. What you want is sort of standard granular metadata, including the controlled vocabularies and all of the other metadata I talked about. But instead you have the same kinds of messes that you have today, just easier access to the mess. That doesn't produce interoperability. It's a partial solution. And I think we see a similar phenomenon in some other ways. Um, people who talk about FAIR and FAIR implementation often trivialize it. They say, oh, everything has a DOI and now it's FAIR. No, it's not fair, it's identifiable, there's a difference. And being identifiable is part of fair, yes, but it's only a part of fair. Or they put a thin layer of discovery metadata on something and say, oh, you can find it, now it's fair. And that's not good enough. We have to be realistic about it. Um, in order to solve the problems of interoperability and reusability, and not just findability and access, we actually need a lot more metadata. And CVs are core to having that base metadata that we can build the complete picture on. We need machine actionable standard controlled vocabularies supplemented with machine actionable granular standard metadata across the board if we're actually gonna solve this problem. And yet that's not what we get. And I feel like 
in some ways, there's a failure of understanding about the challenge with controlled vocabularies and with all the other metadata in this picture. And we're not going to get fair if we don't actually accept the extent of the problem. Now, I don't want to be too negative about this because I feel like there are some very good developments in this in this space. Um, I work a lot with World Fair and, and the Cross-Domain Interoperability Framework, or CDIF. And what that is, is basically a set of minimum recommended metadata for performing different fair functions. And of course, um, controlled vocabulary is a part of that picture. And we have other um, initiatives that are engaging with the same space. Things like the EOSC Interoperability Framework, there are projects in fair impact. Um, there's quite a long list of these initiatives. And I think we've done a fair job of collaborating in certain issues, notably around mapping uh, controlled vocabularies. Um, there's an emergent good practice for describing and disseminating controlled vocabularies and um, a, a lot of recommendations around other metadata as well that place CV in that overall metadata framework. So I do think that there's a, a sort of um, hope for the future here. The problem, of course, is that um, we can have good practice, but will we follow good practice? So I want to talk about the importance of not failing here. And I'm, I'm going to, I don't want to be alarmist and I don't want to be too far out here, but I'm going to describe something that I think is pretty real and that people don't maybe recognize sufficiently. I think we're actually at a historical inflection point in how we organize knowledge. Um, you probably know people, I mean, I'm old enough that almost everybody's a, a youngster now, but when I look at younger people, they seem to live in the network as much as they do in the physical world. People are focused on their devices like half the time. And they're, they're having very real interactions and doing real things on the network. And so they exist in a sort of shared space. Their reality is not just the physical world, it's also the virtual world. And we can pretend that it's not as important. I think a lot of people make that assumption, but I don't think it's really true. Um, I think we've reached a point where if resources do not exist online, if they don't exist within the network, they fundamentally don't exist for, for any purpose whatsoever. People will not today dig out paper books from a, a library off their dusty shelves to look up controlled vocabularies. They just won't do it. If they can't Google it, it isn't real. And um, I mean, that's, of course, a generalization. But I think it's an, an important aspect of where we're go heading as a society. Now, I'm American. And when I think about the damage that's done by misinformation out there in social media, out there online, it's profound. And people say, oh, let's regulate the social media companies. I don't think that's the answer. I think the answer to disinformation is good information. Um, and what that means is that we need to be able to encode knowledge in a way that naturally works within the way that people operate on the network. So our expression of what we know and the data we rely on to know it and how we understand that data needs to be encoded in a way that naturally works within a networked architecture. Um, this means using graphs to organize our knowledge, to organize our CVs. I was really happy to see in the Mentis uh, poll there how many people are working with ontologies because ontologies are graph-based. And I think it's super important that all of our knowledge encoding and describing data be fit into the sort of um, open data paradigm where it, every node that we put out can be navigated to as part of a graph because I think that's the way people are gonna start to deal with the information that we're gonna rely on to counter disinformation and to base policy on moving into the future. Now, this is a little out there maybe, but I, I think it's at least something that's worth considering. And I do think that we have an opportunity to frame our description of data in a way that is optimally useful in the world that we're headed towards. And I'm not sure people think about this very much. Um, this is my last slide and I have some suggestions for not failing. I really like the 10 Simple Rules document. I've worked with a lot of the authors and they're very, very smart people. I think it's a great starting point. I think fundamentally, SCOS and XGOS are the basic expression of controlled vocabularies in a machine actionable way. Um, I think when you're talking about mappings, um, SM is probably the starting point. Um, we should really think about multilingual use because a lot of controlled vocabularies are national, but the network isn't. One thing that these large language models are very good at is actually uh, translations within controlled frames. And um, RDF formats are very good at encoding language equivalents. So we have good technology for this. 
No, I'm not saying you can't, you won't have to double check everything with domain experts, but people should think about um, putting out controlled vocabularies in multi in multiple natural languages, because that's important for how people will use them. Um, I think it's very important that people pay attention to emerging best practice. I mentioned World Fair and Fair Impact in these initiatives for controlled vocabularies, but also for the full set of fair metadata, because I think controlled vocabularies are only really part of that picture. And people should not be seduced by partial solutions. I think that um, that's really core to the reason we're failing to really disseminate controlled vocabularies in an effective way today. I think it's a problem that can be solved if we focus on the issue and focus on good practice and make that a reality. So I, I feel like we we can um, sort of seize this opportunity if, if we decide to do it and that there's some fairly easy steps we can take. But I'm a little concerned that we won't because I think the consequences of that kind of failure could be pretty severe. And um, on that note, I'm, I'm going to stop. So that's I, I hope you found something in there to to, to of interest or of um, to think about. Right. Uh, good morning. Good everything from wherever you are. It's almost 1 a.m. in Nigeria, and uh, it's uh, really an honor and privilege to be participating at this event and to be speaking to my experience leading the virus outbreak data uh, Africa project. This is more like uh, going to be like a um, practice focused presentation. It's not. Uh, that much of a technical thing. It's more of an experience sharing. And then I hope uh, I don't lose many of you uh, along the way. I want to check, I hope my slide is advancing. So I want to start with a bit of history. The idea of a fair in Africa actually formally started with the COVID-19. Yes, we've had a few of uh, graduate students who were in Europe and some part of North America who were doing some fair-related research at that time, but it wasn't that popular. And then a few of them had come around to do some workshops to kind of uh, create awareness about the, uh, the fair data management process. But um, it was really that popular. And then there was that COVID-19 and there was a disruption and then uh, there was a lot of lockdown. And so we saw opportunities to do something new and many of them sold the idea of uh, kind of um, ensuring data ownership in Africa because we've had experience with the Ebola viral disease in West Africa and some parts of East and Central Africa where the observational patients data were collected from Africa and they were taken out and were aroused elsewhere. So Africa as a continent really couldn't even learn anything from the Ebola crisis when COVID came. And then of course, uh, Africa was not a resource point for verified data because they were not just there. So it wasn't uncommon at that time to go for conferences and see researchers talk about the sources of their, uh, of their data, especially health data. And then you see, oh, from North America, uh, from, uh, from Australia, from Euro, from this country, from that country. And then Africa is generally kind of classified as the rest of the world. So a few of us came together at that time to join the virus outbreak data Africa network to see how we can ensure data ownership and handling to ensure that the data on COVID-19 collected in Africa actually resides in Africa and then they become the property of the country of jurisdiction. We also saw that as an opportunity to strengthen the time-informed health system for Africa and to ensure that the rest of the world can actually have access to data from Africa that is resident in Africa. And so we had uh, a network of universities, university health centers, uh, ministries of health and then other government agencies that are related to healthcare uh, up nor North Africa in Tunisia, uh, in Nigeria, in the west of Africa, Zimbabwe in the south, and then of course we had uh, Ethiopia, Kenya, and Uganda, and we're still talking to Tanzania at that time, and Vodan Africa became the first successful implementation of data in residence in the context of COVID-19. So funded by the Philips Foundation, we were able to install 
COVID-19 fair data points in nine locations. So we had two in Uganda, we had two in Ethiopia, one in each of Kenya and Zimbabwe and Tunisia and two in Africa. Then with the working with the graduate students, African graduate students at the Leiden University Medical Center, we also installed the COVID-19 fair data point and were able to demonstrate the possibility of data visiting between Africa and Europe in the phase one. And so we began the, the process of training and training more uh, students from Africa in the principles of fair data implementation. And so it was a bit straightforward at that time because there was a single uh, case reporting form designed by the WHO for the COVID-19. So the fields are basically the same, the vocabularies are basically the same, and then the healthcare workers and the data clerks in the uh, in the health facilities, they were trained with the same thing. So it became diverse where we now had to go beyond COVID-19 to now expand into clinical data, observational patient data beyond COVID-19 in the ANC, and then of course, OPD. So I'll use the case of Nigeria as an example. Nigeria has 36 states plus the FCT, which is like 37 states. And then there are three levels of hospital. We have uh, the, the kind of what we call the county, which is the lowest level, and then uh, which is the community. Then we have the secondary, which is owned by the state. And then we have the tertiary, which is owned by the federal government. So these three, they're in the same country. So if we have one state, like I take my state, quite where I live, the vocabularies for the primary health care will have some slight difference from that of the secondary owned by the state, from that of the tertiary owned by the federal government. And we now observe all this scenario across the different countries. There were no uniformity and everything. And that was what uh, informed. So we first built the first architecture for uh, observational patient data, as is saying here, I'm trying to be conscious of the time. And then, um, so we had the hospital data in the form of bulk input. Those are data that have been collected on paper or some on spreadsheet. And we had to build an embeddable editor for the clinics and then to create the metadata for the clinic and metadata for the patient data. And then we at the Vodan Africa WHO Smart Guideline Compliance uh, data entry. And some of these country already have the health information system, like in the uh, part of Nigeria and uh, mostly Northern uh, Ethiopia and some parts of Uganda, they already had a DHIS. So of course the data already, uh, the DHIS is a repository so even after collecting the clinic data, we must have to put in a duplicate at the DHIS. And then there is the dashboard for analytics within each hospital because the primary aim then was to provide uh, access to data for critical uh, data at the point of care, which was not in place. And then there is also the data point hosted uh, on Stanford uh, CEDA at that time, which is publicly available to host the metadata for each clinic. And then, then for the clinical data owned by Vodan Africa, there is also the, uh, the dashboard. So like there are kind of three levels of view. Then there is the case of Tunisia, which is kind of unique. Tunisia is more interested in research data on the impacts of COVID-19 on migrants in Tunisia, part of North Africa and the greater part of Niger. And so we had to modify the architecture, the wooden Africa architecture, localization architecture for our research data. And then some of the participating university teaching hospitals were interested in both research data and clinical data. They were both interested in repository both uh, kinds of data. And so we had to have the combined architecture to have the editor, at the clinic or university, and then the metadata for the clinic or the university and metadata for the clinical or research data. And then following the same process, then we had uh, removed uh, 
the DHIS because we work with the GoFair office uh, with the Andrea project at that time. And so we have the uh, hospital repository, the joint metadata hospital repository, and then we have the clinic or university repository, and then still uh, the different dashboards. And it continues. And we had to implement this in, then we had expanded to Liberia in West Africa, in addition to Nigeria and Uganda and Kenya, Tanzania, Zimbabwe, Ethiopia, and Somalia, and we're able to install these data points. So how did we handle the differences in vocabulary? Um, oh, thank you, just, um, just two more minutes. Thank you, Francisca. Oh, okay. So I'm just going to, uh, so I'll just uh, go on to the data creation process for the Bodan vocabularies. So I take the Kenya and Nata Care Register, for example. So this is uh, the case reporting form. And if the voda vocabulary checks the vocabulary, if it already exists, then it simply just goes to the bio portal because it's already there and completes the rest of the verification process. If it does not exist, then we now have to use the spreadsheet to create the metadata for the vocabulary. And then once that is done, it goes through the entire process again to the open web language, and then it goes into the ontology repository. So the next time uh, another clinic tries to use this, if it's the last one that was created, oh, it exists, so it ignores this process and goes on. And that was how we're able to, so we had to create different, different vocabularies to kind of uh, handle all the, uh, 88 health facilities where this is installed. I don't know. Yeah, so I have the dashboard here. There are 30 in Ethiopia, three in Kenya. Uh, we have uh, one facility in Liberia. I don't know if I'm able to open a web page and if you all can see my browser. Yeah, so we this is that. the yeah, Africa we'll dashboard. And we have, uh, thank you, mm -hmm. eight countries with 67 health facilities so far with patient instances and this, and then it keeps on. So uh, let me take the case of Ethiopia. So we have the different health facilities. We can look at the Adia Health Center. Uh, so we have uh, two OPD metadata, uh, which was last updated this day, and then we have the ANC one, and then it continues like that. So that is the experience I really want to share, and I will be happy to take questions on how we're able to now handle this diversity in vocabularies across eight countries in 88 health facilities with uh, varying um, um, degrees or um, diversity in vocabularies. Thank you all very much. Hey, good morning, everyone. Um, so today we'll be presenting kind of an update of what we've been doing. So last year, uh, we discussed a little bit more about uh, this project we've been doing with uh, Guruni Yoruba community, in, uh, indigenous community, where we developed a uh, health um, a based application, a set of applications actually, uh, using a new technology called Pods. So, um, right. So I'm I'm gonna give you guys a bit of an introduction, uh, and then I'm I'm gonna give you a bit of a demo as well uh, as to what we've been doing so far. So Pods, uh, a personal online data store, is kind of like a place where you can store your own data and have full control over that data. So the idea is that you have your own data store instead of, uh, let's say, Facebook having their own databases or Twitter having their own databases, Google having their own databases and giving us access to those data. We, our own data is stored in our own Pods. So, and then we do have the control over who gets access to this data and at what time, and we can have, uh, like we can revoke those access at any time, at any time we want. Um, so the individual, the idea is that individual um, uh, as the first data user and the first data owner of their own data. So, when we have this kind of a con uh, this kind of a concept, um, the advantage that we are getting is that it is not just a data store; it can be an ecosystem for innovation as well. 
So for instance, the picture here, um, the picture to your right side actually. So that's your pod. And then um, you can, so the innovators, the developers like us, we can develop different softwares to access that, uh, like access the data from your own pod and provide different services. So that's the idea of uh, the personal online data stores. So Solid is kind of a project uh, started by Sir Tim Berners-Lee um, back in, I think, 2016 or 2017, a um, couple of years ago. So that uh, the Solid is kind of a specification that's developed for these personal online data stores. So using this specification, we can develop uh, a server that can, uh, you know, that we can have our own ports. So the uh, we already have multiple open source uh, solid servers available. Uh, you can see there are some links to uh, those servers available here. So each app, so the general idea, so the centralized databases where we have now has centralized um, databases for each app, right? So the Facebook has their own database. Google has their own database. But with decentralized approaches like solid pods, we can have apps to apps point into different uh, pods. So the pods are the same, but we can have different apps point into the same pod and providing different services. So that's the advantage we are getting over this, you know, general um, uh, naive way of uh, storing data. And the project we've been doing. Uh, is we are using this uh, technology, the solid pods technology in the Yoruba community up in North Queensland. So that's an indigenous community uh, and their health service actually want to develop uh, a set of apps that can uh, basically manage patients' health data uh, and at the same time provide patients access to their own data and have them controlling their own health data. So, so they contacted us uh, uh, about uh, one and a half years ago and we started developing these apps for them based on this idea of pods. So they already have the existing system as well over here. So what we are doing right now is we are developing these data pipelines um, in order to get existing data into patient's pods. And then once the patient's pods has their own data, then we develop these apps. So we are currently developing three apps, Health Worker, in Individuals app, and Guruni app. Actually, we talked about this uh, last time we, we were here. So I won't go into much detail about those. And these apps basically access the data in the pods and then provide services such as uh, these uh, encryption of data, data analytical modules, authentication modules, uh, so on and so forth. Okay, so kind of an idea, like a little bit of an idea of those three apps. Uh, so the individuals app is where the individual patients have their own data stored and have their own data, uh, so have their own analytics. So the indie apps provide patients with the diabetic. So we are kind of focusing on diabetic patients at the moment. So we are we are hoping to run a trial in the uh, coming two months uh, with a small cohort of patients in the Araba uh, to test our apps. So the individuals app is the app uh, which gets to the patients. And the clinic app is the app which gets to the uh, actual uh, to the health center, to the doctors where they can have, uh, depending on what kind of data they have available from the patients, they can have different analytics. And then we have another app called Care Coordination Team app, which is purely developed for data collection. So they have these care coordination teams going out in the community, uh, collecting data from patients. And this app is purely developed for those uh, that purpose. Once they collect this data, they, that data directly goes to the patient's pods and patient can then access that data at any time they want. 
So the security and privacy architecture that we've been uh, talking, uh, so uh, we've been developing in these uh, three apps is so that that was the main like main point of this presentation. Um, so the idea is that the every data stored in ports are encrypted and no one else can have access to those uh, data. Even the system admin, uh, even though they can see the data, they will only see encrypted data. So without these keys, uh, they cannot have access to the original you know, plain text data. Um, so the individual here has their own pod and they have these kind of set of keys, uh, master key and public private key pair, and then they have a set of data files which they store their um, health data. And these health data or data files are encrypted using uh, something called random session keys. And we want to uh, encrypt or we want to keep these random session keys secure as well. And for that, we are using a password that's only known by uh, the individual himself. So the individual knows the master key and he encrypts these random session keys. And they also, uh, we encrypt all, uh, the private key as well. So the private public key pair actually is used to share the data between ports. So if someone else need to share their own uh, data with Bob, then what happens is that they use the public key of uh, Bob and then use that public key to encrypt these session keys of those their data, and then share that uh, encrypted uh, session keys with the Bob. And then once we once Bob has these encrypted session keys, he can use his own private key to decrypt uh, decrypt these session keys, file paths, and access list uh, in order to get access to uh, this data. Um, so that's the idea of uh, the security and privacy architecture. So I'll just uh, give uh, Sergio a chance to uh, discuss about the ontologies. Yeah, thanks Anushka. Hi. So regarding the system ontologies, we are uh, developing uh, two ontologies. One, it's about the uh, health and personal clinical information of the patients. So, um, the ontology, uh, it's a, 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 we are developing in a bottom-up uh, approach and that is based on uh, the current use cases. So the main classes uh, are about the uh, person uh, and patient and the form related to all the uh, information we gather from uh, the uh, data collection uh, team uh, app. And also recently we have included um, a time series uh, data model to capture uh, all the, uh, and do this uh, analysis over time or different physiological um, aspects of uh, clinical data. And then the, the second model is the secure uh, poll data model or SPDM based on uh, the presented a private uh, data security uh, architecture for the system. So here we are focusing mainly on two uh, cases, uh, use cases. One is the encryption and the other one is the data sharing. The data sharing aspect, it's uh, the most important thing about uh, achieving the decentralized environment or ecosystem uh, that, that we are aiming in, in this, uh, for this system. So as you can see here, we we have a person has a pod and then the data files, and that is the, the part of the share keys. So this is still an uh, ongoing data model uh, that we are uh, developing and included in the internal mechanism of the system. Yeah. And yeah, that's it. So any questions? Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to speak with you today about some work that we've been doing probably for a little over a year now in conjunction with the International Classification of Disease of the Left Through Vision, which is a, a classification that's been published by the World Health Organization for a number of years. 
And so today I have Dr. Michael Pine and Dr. Chris Tompkins on the call with me. They'll be joining me during the Q&A for the portion of the, the session. So thank you again. A little, here's our bios. Uh, these slides are available, so I'm not going to go in depth about uh, the information here on this slide, only to say that we have broad experience in clinical medicine research and terminologies and classifications. As I mentioned, uh, the International Classifications, uh, Classification of Diseases by the World Health Organization has been around for 100 plus years. It's evolved over time. It started as a mortality classification. And I think around in the 1940s, it expanded into morbidity. And at that time and a and little bit later into the, the sixth and then seventh revision and on into where we are today, there's been a number of countries who've adapted it. So they, they felt that, you know, while it is a classification that, <clears throat> excuse me, works for mortality and morbidity, there are some things that perhaps aren't in the WHO version that needed to be expanded upon. So I just have four examples of that on the, on the screen here. Uh, the one at the top left is the one on the, from the US, the Centers for Disease Control, who oversees the ICD classification. We have CM at the end of our modification called clinical modification. Then to the right of that is the German modification. And then the two below that are the Canadian classification, the modification, and then the Australian modification. And these are only four examples of what currently exists in ICD-10 or the 10th revision. So while we have one system that comes out of WHO, when uh, WHO produced ICD-10 and night, well, it was actually uh, the World Health Organization uh, basically passed that it should become a classification in place of nine in 1990 and countries were able to use it uh, from 1994 onward. And from that point, like I said, there's been a number of countries who have adapted it for their purposes beyond morbidity and mortality. And there's many use cases today for the classification. It's just not for statistics, which is where it started. It's used for things like uh, case mix, uh, quality measurement, and those types of things. And then using it beyond its original focus, that's where a lot of these ad adaptations or adaptions came into play. So what happened in the 11th revision? Well, in, in 2019, uh, the World Health Assembly basically said, we, we have a new system that we'd like to have people begin to use. And that system is much more than a replacement of the ICD-10 that came out of WHO back in the 90s. They really took a look at the fact that what's happening in the world of terminology and also what's happening in the world of uh, electronic tools so when they created this, and this has been um, this has been started long, uh, probably 2007, I think is when they began the work. But what they found was, is there a better way to actually have a clinical system where maybe perhaps it could be used from a standard approach? Meaning, is there one system perhaps that could be adopted across all countries so we wouldn't have that variation in the modifications that we had with ICD-10? So they created what's called the HUFIC Foundation. Now, besides ICD-11, there are other classifications uh, that WHO considers to be their reference classifications. Those happen to do with uh, interventions or the International Classification of Health Interventions, commonly called ITCHI, and then the International Classification of Function and Disability, or ICF. So when I talk about the WHO uh, HUFIC, the foundation, it's more than just diseases and disorders. It includes ICD-11, but it also includes those other types of entities which would address functional descriptions, for example, interventions, and they have this whole new area called extension codes. And then from that foundation, that content, that large body of content of all entities, certain aspects of that are pulled and a constrained subset is created. So everything that comes out of the foundation uh, as a linearization has, has its source as the foundation. So the linearization is defined here, just both of these coming directly from the HUFIC content model reference guide, is it's basically a subset for a suitable purpose. 
Now, when we think about the replacement for ICD-10, that purpose again originally uh, began as morbidity and mortality. Uh, one of the things that's interesting to think about for the purposes of this MMS, as we often refer to it, which is the ICD-11 for morbidity and mortality statistics, is it, it could be, not necessarily is, a replacement for not only ICD-10, of course it should be for the WHO version, but could it be a replacement for NL classifications that are legacy systems, like I showed you a moment ago on the slide. So when it first was created as a linearization, there was some discussion about maybe having separate linearizations for mortality and another linearization for morbidity. But it was decided that in fact, that wasn't the way to go. And so WHO created this single linearization for both purposes. Now, what's come about because of that has been a number of countries, the US being one and some other countries as well, who have these legacy systems that is it going to work for us? And it hasn't in the past when ICD-10 was developed, they, the, as I said, adaptations were actually created. So is it fit for purpose for those current uses such as case mix and research and quality of measures? And if the answer to that question is no, if not, well then should countries go about their business and create some type of uh, modification or clinical modification or the next question is, and this where this is this is the the issue of consideration for what I'm going to talk about next. Perhaps is there a linearization that aligns with ICD-11 MMS, but also extends it in using the foundation? And I'll explain a bit about what I mean. Thank so this group. Minutes, Kathy. Okay, got it. Uh, what we did was we created a couple of things. So actually, three aspects of what I'm going to talk about in terms of the the um, the, uh, the innovation model. One of them is a comprehensive clinical linearization where we've gone into the foundation and we pulled content out of it because we felt, again, it's not going to work as is. We need a better system than the MMS. And I think other countries who have done their research have found the same thing. Not everything in MMS is what needs to be there for the purposes that they have. And of course, anytime you have an old system and you're working into a new system, there needs to be some type of map for longitudinal data analysis. So just to give you an idea that we have hyperplasia maxilla, which is coded three, five, four different ways in these four legacy systems. And in MMS, there's what's considered to be an other specified. So there's no specific code for this. Well, in CClear, we have a specific code for that, as you can see in the DAOE, 0.03 with the CCL as the subscript. So we've tried to pull in from the foundation very specific data that will help countries, including ourselves, perhaps adopt a system that will work for the use cases. I'm not going to go into detail with this because it, it's um, given the time, but the main things I wanted to point out is the main purpose of CClear is clinical care, and I'll show you in a moment why that is. It is non-proprietary. We've absolutely taken advantage of all the, the aspects of what WHO has available to us in regards to creating computer-friendly tools. And we actually come up, have come up with a syntax that will help people, again, gather that data using the codes of CClear and create some type of description of what they want to. And so we have the innovation model, which includes the comprehensive code set, which I mentioned in terms of the codes. We created this linearization, which we call a com composite linearization. We have syntax where we can take all of that composite linearization and make sense of it using the syntax. And then we've gone and created tools as well. So I mean, advance here. So what, why have we done this? Well, we wanted to harness all of WA, all of ICD-11's power because there's a lot of power behind the foundation and there's a lot of content in regards to linearizations and what you can do because we wanted to be able to do all of the things that are on this page. We wanted to look at it from the area of prevention and early intervention, patient coordination, risk adjustment resource, and particularly the clinical outcomes. So what have we done beyond the linearization and the syntax? Well, right now we're working, we're working towards what we called tools. And these are an expansion upon the coding tools that WHO already has, but we've taken a step further and we've actually been able to come up with ways in which we can translate clinical language 
using the code set, the linearization and the syntax and create coded clusters. And then from those, take them back to the clinical language from which they came. And here's just one example. Again, it's a lot of words on a page on a slide and I realize that, but bottom line, what we're trying to show here is there's a lot of content on this patient, this 67 year old person or woman, and then what would happen if we only used MMS, if we take, took all of that, we only have a very short description of what this person really has and what's going on with them. But if we use the C clear cluster, that includes the linearization, the syntax, what we end up with is really a description very well uh, described, very well stated in regards to what this patient of the 67 year old woman has, because it takes into account all the information that's in the foundation in such a manner that the syntax can create those code clusters and then based on those code clusters, identify back exactly what happened. And with that, um, I think I made it close anyway, 20 some seconds, I think. <laughs> okay, yeah, uh, Bicycle Thesaurus, um, fifth or 15 slides in 12 minutes. Um, uh, so yes, there is such a thing. I'm going to talk about this thesaurus. Um, what is biosecurity? Oh my goodness. Um, I don't really have time to talk a lot about that, but I'm from the center of excellence for biosecurity risk analysis. Um, and what we do, we, we're not just concerned with things like shipping containers, but we answer questions for department of agriculture, like how many of those containers should I inspect for a pest? And I, I, I don't have time to waste resources. What should, so we are a bunch of economists and statisticians and not just uh, sandal wearing ecologists. Um, so we answer questions like this, but not just shipping, not just about shipping containers. So um, there is a there is a, a project context to what I'm talking about today. Um, we are developing a biosecurity uh, metadata portal. So we're extracting research metadata that's relevant to biosecurity from uh, places where the research is actually most practical and relevant to decision makers and that's in the gray literature world so not behind instead of being behind paywalls but you know from regulatory uh, uh, portfolio government uh, industry uh, and some open access research um, sources as well um yeah, so there is there is a biosecurity thesaurus uh, that's in development. Is it's really being driven by development of this project? But I we and I certainly always feel it's important to share what you're doing, even if it only ever does get used in a particular application pro, um, context. Um, it's published through Research Vocabularies Australia. Uh, you can learn more about that by following the link there. If you're familiar with Research Vocabularies Australia, do have a look for it and and, and other interesting stuff. Um, so I mentioned we're collecting metadata and uh, this is just a bit of flexing about who we're collecting it from. Um, but I guess the, the the point I want to make here is that when you're collecting metadata from lots of different sources, it's in lots of different formats. And so we have challenges regarding harmonization and transformation of that metadata. Um, and without going to what all these sort of clouds and applications mean and what they are, uh, we are doing some uh, uh, transformation work for all of the metadata coming from all of those organisations, um, including um, applying vocabularies. So the reason we're using a thesaurus is to help to harmonise the description of those all of those metadata sets that are coming from different places. And really to help with um, one of the project objectives, and that's to deal with the language ambiguity problem in biosecurity, and which exists everywhere, of course, you know, but certainly in biosecurity. Um, so I, I wanted I wanted to just touch on today um, a little bit about what goes into a controlled vocabulary and the, the reasons for for. for but why we make decisions about how how we develop a vocab. So this is a little bit of a carpentry sort of practical uh, step through. Um, I'm going to talk about three different sources of warrant. So by that, I mean, uh, what is our rationale or explanation for why a term or a concept ends up in one of these vocabularies? Um, and in the keynote this morning, there was, uh, I, I like to mention that these uh, controlled vocabularies never exist outside of a, uh, framework or a model context. Um, certainly that's something I'm interested in. And with the thesaurus we're developing, 
we pay attention to things like legislation, uh, that legal sort of framework, I guess, uh, or, or things like, you know, websites and how they're structured. So site navigation, it, it gives us some hints about how a taxonomy or a thesaurus might be structured. Uh, or models, this is the biosecurity continuum, which talks about activities, you know, pre-border, at-border, post-border and, and things. And, and the, these are useful for informing, you know, the overall framework of a vocabulary, I, I, I can test anyway. Um, that's, that's, the, that's the top down. The bottom up development um, is often an analysis of the literature that you want to tag, right? So this is the literary warrant. Um, that's a big job. Um, we need machines to help us do this. Um, so, because uh, the, the literature is vast. Um, so I'll, I'll get to how we're sort of tackling that in just a moment. Um, and the third, the third source of warrant is in vocabulary construction, sometimes called user warrant. So, you know, how are people searching? What language do they use? How do they discuss topics? Maybe not so much in literature, but in in, in uh, communications and social settings and 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 in search contexts. Um, so what so what we did as part of this project is we did a survey of biosecurity participants and we asked the question, "What are your questions about biosecurity? What do you want to know?" Um, and we're interested in the 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 makeup of those questions and analyzing the questions and saying well what are these questions made up of what content what concepts are found in the questions um and are there different ways of asking the same questions or does the question structure itself lend itself to a particular kind of problem how many containers should i test for a, a bug um how many you know how many salmon should i test for a disease in a hatchery or whatever, whatever it is. Um, a lot of these questions have a similar structure, for example, like a statistical um, structure. So this is really the third input for our project. We've got our sort of top-down framework analysis and bottom-up literary analysis, but also our user question analysis. And um, and and actually the, you know, the, the results from that are available um, if you're interested. Um, and we, there's a preliminary classification of those um, those questions. Um, and so we, we, we run the text from the, the literature that we're collecting, the questions, and to some extent, those high-level frameworks through a process, which is a little bit of a black box. I can't tell you, it's, you know, we use some proprietary software called Pool Party to, to do some corpus analysis. And that tells us about the frequency of those terms, but also the, the relevance when you consider also mutualism, you know, do the terms occur next to each other because they're part of a phrase or is that just a coincidence? And um, so it gives us these interesting stats that help inform us whether or not that term is a concept, an enduring concept that should be included into the, um, into the SCOS vocabulary. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm almost done actually. Um, sorry if I'm talking too fast. So, and this is, um, uh, uh, so I just wanted to, um, oh, it doesn't even have a title, is it? So what, what the hell is this slide? Um, I just thought I'd just make a point about um, a vocabulary um, publishing and collaboration. I, I really believe that one of the reasons why, one of the reasons why we take our vocab work and we put it on the web and we put it in registries where it can be described and discovered and, and discussed and pointed at is it so that someone else can say, hey, I'm doing that. I'm doing something like that. Um, and, you know, it's, uh, um, it's, it's a really a recent discovery that some of the, the thesaurus, which is very broad ranging in, in topics, uh, overlaps with some of the, some other vocabulary work that's happening at Department of Agriculture, uh, Fisheries and Forestry, DAF. Um, and so I found, for example, that, that a subtree in, in, in the thesaurus, which is about traps, and traps are used in biosecurity to uh, perform surveillance on invasive species or, or to you know, eradicate them. Um, uh, that there's, there's, there's another smaller concept scheme which focuses directly on traps. And so there's an opportunity there to say, well, what are we going to do now? Are we going to, can we at the very least, can we make 
links between these um, using, you know, SCOS predicates, you know, exact match or close match or something like this. Um, uh, should we be should we be sharing our, the the knowledge that we've gained from our different vocabulary development activities with each other so we can augment each other's you know vocabularies or indeed should we be consolidating these is it, are we creating a mess by letting them you know live in live in parallel and, <clears throat> and 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 actually this is something that I think we're still trying to work out um so I'm not really suggesting the answer there but part of it for me is is the application context. So this is a, just a screenshot from a demo system for this biosecurity portal. But, um, and I don't expect you to be able to read all this, except I'll just say on the left-hand side, here are some vocabs being used as facets and filters and things like this, right? And think about the user experience. How many concept schemes do you want to throw at your user so that they can operate the system correctly? Um, so it might come down to how this stuff is implemented. If you want to model this, uh, what, what I'm finding uh, in the vocab construction game is this question, which is, do I want to have sort of broad reaching uh, vocabularies or do I want to have lots of little concept schemes that focus on particular things? And if you have lots of little concept schemes and that kind of forces you into developing vocabularies to help express them correctly, um, so there are all these trade-offs that have to be made, but it could also be about how these get implemented in a in a discovery system, which is something I'm concerned about because um, I want this to be usable, and um, and I want the vocabs to be maintainable as well. So, um, yeah. So, oh, I guess that's kind of my point there on the last slide. Yeah. Um, implications. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. There you are. Well, uh, that's coming up. Um, I'll just sort of kick on. Um, this morning, we were hearing from um, Arif and Gregory, and there was a few points I sort of noted down which were really of interest. Um, things like, do not be seduced by partial solutions, machine actionable. And uh, these uh, sort of things that, that probably segues quite nicely, coming on to myself from Les there, who's, who's using Research Vocabularies Australia of course, and looking at um, different parts of the vocabularies. But what Arafan was talking about, um, are there, there are much greater challenges in overall curation and governance around all these things. And I guess that's something that we're really trying to look at. Uh, we're still struggling with the screen share there, I think. Um, uh, that's all right. So um, what we've been doing in Australia in the health domain, things are a little bit different in that Australia is trying to go down the route of having a standard for health clinical data, uh, which is SNOMED clinical terms. Um, but of course, there are hundreds and hundreds of different vocabularies and dictionaries and things out there. We're not all stuck on those standards at this point in time. Um, so the problem is, how do you get there? How do you map? What are the real world problems that we're facing? How can we bring it together? But more importantly, we wanted to have a basis from the national standards. So with uh, SNOMED, SNOMED clinical terms, we here in Australia through CSIRO have developed a system that I'll show you a little bit about in a minute for um, allowing Australians to be licensed to use this. And what you can see now is, is that we're looking to widen the tools and things coming out of that to build more standard tools and hopefully that can link in with some of the standards that we were hearing about uh, this morning. But yes, it's uh, in terms of uh, don't be seduced by partial solutions, this is certainly one that I'm going to show you because it's got a way to go. So here's SNOMED. Um, uh, it's good in that it allows you to uh, give very detailed descriptions of, of clinical concepts, but the problem is it's very complex in itself. And in fact, in my space, which is general practice, we hit real world problems of people not having time to code data up like this. So you get all sorts of text in there that's, which can represent a term. And these are the sorts of things that we are wanting to map as well. So it's not necessarily a standard vocabulary, but it's about taking rubbish like this and making sense of it, um, but also supporting the vocabularies. And how can we look at all of this ecosystem? 
Um, and why it's important here, if you look at the middle line here, chronic kidney disease, uh, this is where we did analysis of coded versus free text in the medical record. So government, for instance, um, their national statistics worth off, work off the codes, but they're missing 22.55% of all occurrences of chronic kidney disease for people because most of it's not coded. Uh, so we really need to get this stuff sorted out. You can't rely on coded. Here's uh, Meteor. So this is AIHW. They do a fantastic job around standards um, uh, with their Meteor work. But of course, it does change as well over time. Uh, so it's so what we need to be able to see is how can you migrate uh, between different versions of things and also how can we make it machine oper operable. Uh, so I've been working um, uh, with as, as part of a national initiative here to look at quality assessment, but also terminologies and mappings and being able to get to more consistent common data models. So you can see if you're going to bring common modeling, you need to convert data and you need it to be accurate in the conversions. Um, so through this work, we came up with an idea of taking the RDC's work to the next level by trying to build on some of these other national tools. Um, and this allows us, for instance, to map to things like the OMOP common data model. I'll not go into this in any great, great detail, but for health research, it's the largest one in the world. And there are about a billion patient records that have been mapped to this around the world. It's incredible. You can run massive studies with this. So here's the, here's the vocabulary of Australia portal as it is just now, but it's very much around vocabularies, not mappings. Okay. This is the national system that looks after uh, things like SNOMED coding. It allows all sorts of syndication. It's a very complex system, which is why we wanted to build on this because it's been allow it allows different institutions to do things their own way. In the UK are bigger are big adopters of this, and we've got probably got a, more than a thousand mappings going to SNOMED clinical terms using this in the UK. Um, on top of that, though, what has been developed is, is this tool Snap to SNOMED that allows fairly automated mapping and you know looking up terms to try and see what the final SNOMED code is. So really the clever thing that's been happening now is we've wanted CSIRO to support mapping to lots of different things, not just to SNOMED. Can we just open this up so this is a generic? So if it is Leslie's vocabularies or standards, they could be getting mapped to, never mind, health terms, so this could go far beyond. So that's what we've been doing. Uh, it's just been going a few months now. Uh, so this sort of shows that we we had a workshop to try and kick this off and work, work out some underlying assumptions and specifications. So we've started that and we've started moving to from SNOMED now into other vocabularies. And the idea is to have this on the uh, ERDC research vocabularies website. So it'd be an extension and it would integrate well and hopefully look and feel in a similar manner, something like that. We'll see how it evolves. Um, so we have got this uh, up and running now. So this is actually onto server. And I think for the first time we're actually seeing instead of this being a SNOMED code system, we've actually got one called RX Norm, which is, which is an American drug coding standard that, that's used in that OMOP uh, rep data representation uh, I showed earlier. So that's now represented in here. Um, and we can actually see that within uh, visually. So this visually normally you would see SNOMED in here. So now all of a sudden we're seeing something different in here. So I'm excited when we actually get beyond health even. So we'll see how that goes. Um, and this is actually showing um, the tool that we're wanting to develop further for community curation. So if you look over on the right here, uh, it's quite small, but this is looking at who's reviewing a set of mappings um, and who it's assigned to. Um, and the other thing about this is it's controlled in terms of permissions. So there's a lot of base things that we need nationally and internationally around how you properly curate this, who looks after it, uh, how do you tell the provenance? All these things are a base of this pro of this product, which is why we've uh, aimed to go in this. 
The other thing that we want to do with this is that machine interoperable side of things. Um, so what we've got now is we've got it operational in a first version at ARDC and we've got it working with Australian Access uh, Federation uh, logins. Um, the RX norm works in a testing phase. Uh, now we want to make sure we can do it in other things. Um, the, the key next stage is around the community co-design. We wanted to get the base functionality, but now it's about how people that aren't coders and experts can use this sort of stuff to be able to really understand um, how to map and maintain the concepts. And, and I want to stop people reinventing the wheel. Um, if you look at that meteor example of male and female, how many people have actually looked at databases and said, oh, I've got my way of coding that and so on, and I've already mapped it, and it took me time to map it, so I'm not going to share it with you. You know, so I'm really excited that we've got the ARDC to build a platform where perhaps we can start to uh, get things happening more in the community there. So that automated API interfacing, I think, is really is really going to be important. So I, I kind of like listening about the SSSOM format, for instance, earlier. Just because we're coming up with something new in the health domain doesn't mean to say it can't integrate and work across um, other representations. You know, let's let Scoss and Owl. Um, uh, so it'll be interesting to discuss that a little bit more uh, today and tomorrow. So to finish up then, really what we're aiming uh, for is to build a service that's seen as a national resource for many. So we'd like to work more with Meteor, for instance. Uh, so we'd like to build an automation to AIHW in the way they represent health data and the, their clinical concepts. We're having some discussions about that now. Um, and if we start building up some of the national utilization, then perhaps we can actually get really get the ball rolling and get wider utilization and not restricted to, for instance, the RDCs. People research data commons. We're obviously having a focus in there, um, but we've got at the back of our minds that we don't want to be stuck in, in that rut. And we want to work with everyone in this room to see where we take this. And ultimately, it's about that faster, better, cheaper research and what we can do with it. Okay. Thanks very much. Yep. Here we are. Okay. Go. All right. Wonderful. Sorry for that. So I'm Lizzie Wank at UNSW, and I'm presenting today on building the Austrates plant dictionary into a formal vocabulary. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the lands throughout Australia on which plant trait data have been collected. My home is on the lands of the Dara Margal and Darug people, and I pay my respects to their elders, both past and present. As a quick roadmap for today's talk, first let me introduce Austrates so you understand why we need an Austrates plant dictionary, and then how we went about building the best possible trait definitions and definitions that are simultaneously a simultaneously useful resource to ecologists and bioinformaticians. So if you look at any organism like this eucalyptus tree here, there's three core pieces of information that matter about it. You have to document its name, the taxonomy, where it occurs, and what are its characteristics, its traits. And within the Australian research infrastructure landscape, Austrates is emerging as the go-to location for plant traits, its characteristics. Austrates was first publicly released a little over two years ago with the concurrent release of the data set on Zenodo and a data descriptor in scientific data. It has continued to grow since then and now includes more than 370 data sets from more than 250 contributors. We're approaching 2 million data records with some information for 500 traits and nearly all of Australia's plant taxa. So how are these traits defined? Within the R workflow that compiles Oz traits, it requires a file, traits.yaml, that lists all supported traits. So all 500 traits are documented here together with some core metadata, but it's minimal. For instance, for leaf length, you need a label, a brief description. Is it a categorical or numeric trait? What are the output units and what is its allowed range? For a categorical trait, you have to list the allowed values, but that's it. Better definitions are clearly required. To increase the interpretation of Austrates data, 
to increase the accuracy of how new data are mapped into Austraits, and of course, to increase the interoperability between trait databases. We subscribe wholeheartedly to the Open Traits Network vision of trait databases, where worldwide there are endless databases for different taxonomic groups, some larger, or some smaller, and somehow to maximize reuse of this data, there have to be connections between them. So if we think here about the node of plants, Austraits is one of these little dots for the angiosperms. And by properly defining, documenting the traits, that's one way we can increase the data reuse. So I wanna talk first, what is required for a formal vocabulary? This is well known to everyone in the room here. You need a permanent resolvable URI for each trait concept. The dictionary needs to be published as an RDF serialization and archived in an ontology repository. There need to be links to identical and similar traits in other published vocabularies. More explicit definitions where an individual words, terms are linked to the same term in a different vocabulary. But what does an ecologist view as necessary? It's a quite different list. Yes, the dictionary has to be published, but the ecologists actually are quite happy with the PDF, even though no one here would be. When they think of links to identical and similar traits, simply string matching is fine. And more explicit definitions, I've actually had ecologists ask me to please remove the links to published vocabularies because it makes the definitions hard to read. Meanwhile, they want a dictionary output as a spreadsheet for easy research reuse. They want categorical trait values to be part of specific trait definitions, not as standalone terms. And they simply want definitions linked to research papers, trait handbooks, not to something specific to that trait. So you can see this is a bit of a tug of war between cultures. And we aren't the first to note this. There are some plant trait ontologies out there None is complete, none suffice for us to reuse when we built the Austraits database. Um, we've in particular taken inspiration from the Top Thesaurus, a spinoff of the Tried Global Plant Trait Database. They've done things, for instance, like linked individual terms to um, defined words from other vocabularies. They have not, however, gone as far as to add definitions for nearly all of the tri traits, and there are not unique identifiers. Um, URIs for each trait. So this, this is a starting point, and we've now, our goal has been to create a vocabulary that merges the, what's required for a formal vocabulary, but in a way that ecologists can reuse it and will reuse it. Vocabulary is only useful if the audience sees it as such. So what are some of our steps forward? So we want to create a vocabulary that incorporates the information content ecologists want with the standards required by the bioinformatics community. And just very quickly, what is this information ecologists want? They want trait concepts with clear scopes, explicit definitions, comments about best practice methodology, curated lists of allowable trait values, links to references, expert review of all the allowable ranges and units. And among other things, we had a series of workshops to discuss this for nearly every trait. So for instance, we had a plant tra growth form trait that we considered muddy, confounded, and after much discussion decided that actually the trait values within here could be better divided out into five much more explicit trait concepts. This occurred again and again. We also added descriptive metadata, keywords, what structure was measured, what characteristic was measured, was it a length or a mass or a force. We added metadata to document the trait concepts, references, links to databases, reviewers. But again, when I say links, these were mostly just string matches. But as a starting point, it was good enough and has already led to one paper that showed how merging together trait databases can increase trait coverage. But then if we think about this more now from the perspective of how do we build a formal vocabulary, one thing we had to do was add resolvable identifiers to each one of the trait concepts. And for this, we turn to w3id.org, um, the redirect service, and register the APD namespace with 
a unique identifier for each of the 500 traits that redirects to our Git project's GitHub website. Then came the actual steps of me teaching myself how to build this formal vocabulary. I started by attempting to do this in Protégé. And as a beginner, it had its benefits, visual menus, easy for me to integrate different ontologies and port them together, understand the vocabulary, understand what's required for a formal ontology. But it also had its downsides. So all of our data was documented in a series of spreadsheets with columns, each mapped to annotation properties, but that's what I had. Protégé was very constraining in what are classes versus individuals and properties, incredibly clunky to correct mistakes. And as Rowan Brownlee can attest, I never actually created an output that passed a SCUS validator. So I turned to a different attempt, something that's very familiar to ecologists. I use R code to build an ontology from the base up. This meant that I could use my spreadsheets that and could simultaneously create RDF um, representations and human friendly versions. It was easy to change mappings, easy to add traits, edit traits, and importantly, you can reuse this code for additional ontologies. There were downsides. I don't think I could ever have built a vocabulary like this as a beginner. Protege taught me what the proper output was and how to go about it, and then I could turn to R. But what I now have is I have an R script where I can simultaneously take my input data sets and output the CSV spreadsheets that ec ecology researchers request, an HTML file, our website that is easy to search and peruse, and a series of machine readable formats, all from the same data inputs and a single script. And all these output formats are archived on Zenodo. We've had a new release just last week. The turtle file is available to download or look at at Research Vocabularies Australia. And then we have our website, which includes all outputs as well, and where you can simply scroll through and look at the different trait concepts. So here is leaf length, the same very short trait definition we had at the beginning now has this much information content attached to it. So here is the resolvable URI and all the annotation properties. Each one is linked to a well-established vocabulary, to SCUS, to DC terms. Just two minutes, Elizabeth. What's that? Uh, two minutes to go. Yep. And then information such as keywords, what's the measured characteristic, the measured structure. Each of these has terms that's the keyword that an ecologist wants to see, but those have been linked back to published vocabularies. We had to be a little more creative with how we did our exact matches. For some terms, so the trait ontology has leaf length as one of its terms. So there we could do a proper exact match to a URI, but the big, global trait databases, they have a project web page, but they don't have resolvable URIs for the individual terms. And so we had to creatively map this in as a simple string into which we embedded the project website. It's not perfect from the bioinformatics perspective, but it offers sort of a linkage between what the ecologists require. We didn't want to leave these mappings out simply because they don't yet have URIs. Meanwhile, all references are indeed linked to identifiers, and all reviewers are identified by their ORCIDs. You'll see as well up here with the description, we have the description that includes all the encoded words from ontologies, and we've include, had it as well without them so that the ecologist can simply read a sentence. And finally, there's sort of an additional resource that we've created with this. In addition to the actual published vocabulary for the 500 terms, by far the most comprehensive plant trait vocabulary in existence, we have the resources freely available that we use to create this ontology. So anyone from the ecological sciences or anyone who codes in R can simply see how we've merged together our CSV files using a couple of R scripts into the different 
RDF serializations. And to us, it's as important to share these resources as the vocabulary. And I hope maybe somebody else can use R to code ontology in the future. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so for Thanks, those Elizabeth. people who haven't come across it, so the Oscope Geochemical Network is an Oscope funded initiative, um, which has really been looking to com combine um, the earth science um, departments at Australian universities and some other sectors um, in response to this community identified need, need um, to better tackle the data standardization and organization of all these masses of, of earth science related data coming out of these various institutions. And so a large part of this has been building um, what we call OzGeochem, which is our, our flagship um, kind of front end platform, which acts as a geospatial archive um, and also dissem dissemination and exploration um, platform, allowing users to kind of in upload and interact with a large volume of um, geoscience data from a number of disciplines, um, both from Australia, but also kind of somewhat misleadingly given the name um, internationally as well. Um, and obviously in order to do this, um, we've, we've needed to create um, quite extensive um, voc vocabularies for earth science, which uh, um, either um, kind of from whole cloth or adapting ones within the community. Um, and so these are built largely as um, custom relational data formats um, within SCOS vocabularies. But we've, we've tried to make them particularly bespoke for the geoscience community, but also very importantly, um, as the talk, last talk touched on, accessible for non-data scientists. And we've also tried to make these, while um, suitable to take existing data, really aiming to be forward looking with an um, aim to export data and, um, directly for machines. So within the um, earth sciences, there's quite a variety of kind of sub-disciplines and um, um, data types that we can collect. But so we can broadly kind of break it down into these, I guess, three, three domains where most all of our um, data is in some way linked to a sample that we're analyzing it, being that a physical rock or mineral sample or things like um, groundwater or um, soils that think I'm um, looking at contamination. And then we have what we um, might think of our, as our primary data, some, so information that's telling you something about the age or the history or, or the or the, um, the chemistry of that sample and associated metadata. And then the the way by which this is acquired, which is obviously a complex relationship and there's can, there can be multiple ways of collecting different types of data. And so where we are at the moment in this project is we've established vocabularies for some of these, but not others, and kind of continuing to work on others as well. And today I'm gonna to focus just a little bit more on the geochemistry side of things, um, because that's probably the most, I guess, accessible. So just quickly, um, what we talk about, when what we mean when we talk about geochemistry is this is essentially the composition of the rock or mineral or whatever our sample specimen is. Um, so be that the elemental composition or the um, composition, um, the amount of um, a certain compound in there. Um, and so this obviously has um, overlaps with fields like chemistry, so we can draw on other, other vocabularies um, and resources there. So this is, I guess, this is a snapshot of how we've built this vocabulary. So like all of them, um, we've done, we've, we haven't kind of gone out by ourselves. We've assembled a, an advisory group of experts in the field um, so that we're not just propagating one lab's idea, we're trying to get as much information and be as, as accessible as we can. Um, and so we're, we're currently in the process of um, uploading these to RVA. Um, and so I guess this is set up as um, we have this, hot, this highest order um, um, concepts, which are the, uh, the geochemical geochemistry data point, which tell us something about the, the sample um, and what these data rep represent and then something about like the composition and the, um, it's the spatial information, which is the aliquot, which I'll kind of step through um, at the moment. So the geochemical chemistry data point is basically telling us what is being analyzed and how it's being analyzed. So um, also things like the analysis scale and the mineral type. Um, so is, are we looking at a whole rock or a whole um, soil sample, or are we, are we actually looking at a single spatial, spatial point on a single mineral? And again, we're, we're linking where we can to external vocabularies. So things like the MINDAT and the um, IMA um, 
for mineralogical and um, geological descriptions. So again, we're not trying to reinvent this. Um, but also everything is tied to um, ORC IDs. So there is um, data attribution to anything that's being, being uploaded here. Um, and then sort of moving down the hierarchy, we have what we call the aliquot. This is telling us where in the sample is, be um, is being analyzed. So are we just doing one large sample or are we taking a lot of subsamples and having some spatial context between them? Um, and then we start to step into um, the actual, you know, what we can think of as maybe the hard data, which is what um, what elements, what's their abundance, um, and what is the, the uncertainty associated with those. And again, here we're drawing from um, external vocabulary, so um, so PubChem um, through, through their, um, their repository for um, chemical information and QUDT for um, units of measure. And then very similarly, they're set up basically the same way is that um, the compound data. So again, how much, um, what are the concentrations and uncertainties associated with these compounds um, but rather than these elements? And again, I'm um, outsourcing to linking to PubChem here for those defini definitions. And so beyond just the, the I guess, the academic sector, we're currently um, working on a project with the state and um, national geosurveys looking to standardize these report, um, reporting standard, standards within um, this elemental and compound data um, and producing templates for the analytical procedures using, um, used to collect that data so that we can really start to move towards sharing this data and making it truly open and fair. So I guess this is just a, a very quick mud map of the flow of geochemical chemical data within the sector at the moment. There's obviously edge cases um, but kind of flowing down from the producers to the ways in which we can make that, this data accessible. So currently we have a lot of data coming out of either university or commercial labs, and then this is going, flowing down into um, end users in the academic and government sectors, um, and then but also in, in industry. And at the moment, you can, as you can kind of see in the bottom, the kind of red, the red fields, a lot of the, this data is very segmented. So what we're trying to do um, through this project working with these surveys is to try and establish and publish this um, some, a, a national vocabulary for geochemical data um, and the, the medical da uh, metadata and for analytical procedures used to collect this and start to um, propose these national best practice reporting standards um, with the end goal that we can start to move towards establishing kind of automated edge sharing between um, government and academic um, academic databases. So I guess if we and and then if we kind of map out how the, this revised um, revised framework would hopefully look, um, we can see this is a, a little bit different, but mainly because mainly in that we're starting to collect connect a lot more of these boxes. Except in the two points, that I sort of want to want to highlight in this is that. That we're trying to achieve in this project are uh, trying to really standardize the data that's coming out of these um, these first order producers so that we can be, be assured that we're getting the requisite um, minimum metadata but also things like the um, the standards and the the units are all, all standardized so then we, when we want to interp um, interpret that together we've got the requisite um, information to do that but then also trying to at, at the other end of it trying to make sure that these data users are actually feeding into um, shared repositories, um, whether that be the Oz, Oz Geochem platform or kind of cross-sharing between the various government, government portals so that we're not um, duplicating data or hiding kind of publicly funded data um, in kind of obscure places, that the real goal is to try and make this as accessible as possible. And as I think we might be might hear from a couple of talks in a little bit, um, we also the Oscope Geochemical Network is also working with international partners. Um, so most of the stuff I've been talking about has been on an Australia Australian scale, but we're obviously open. Um, our, our platform was obviously open to a global audience, um, but and we're also trying to harmonise this um, our kind of vocabularies and databases to start really mapping um, mapping this data. Um, between the large glo um, global databases such as um, EarthChem and GeoRock 
um, an isomat. Um, so I guess just to kind of quickly summarize, um, so the AGN's been collaborating with a, a number of expert international groups to start to produce these um, SCOS vocabularies for the geoscience community. And we've just more recently started to work with the government geosurveys to produce these national um, reporting templates um, to really start taking steps towards um, through op uh, interoperability. Um, and we're currently in the in the process of kind of annoying Rowan and um, uploading these to RVA. So if you do want to kind of um, have a look at these um, in the meantime, they are sort of publicly available, but not in a machine readable format on the OzGeochem website. Um, otherwise, I'm kind of happy to talk about any of them with you more directly. Um, cool. Talk. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge the um, and celebrate the first Australians on whose lands we are meeting and whose traditional lands we always meet to and pay our respects to our elders past, present and future. I've got the abstract because this is a CC BY presentation, so I like to package it up, but I don't expect you to read it. Um, so what I'm just going to do is just quickly set the scene as to why we need to be globally sharing our data. Um, talk a little bit more about the World Fair project that um, Arafan touched on this morning and talk about how we were using FIPS and FERS in one geochemistry and how we also then translated them into trying it with geophysics, very brave. And just point out how you can accelerate the development of fair vocabularies. And so, right, okay. I think it's an old fart. I could argue that what's happening with our science is we're moving more from portrayal of our science and our objectives. And so I always argue geoscience got contaminated by the geological map in 1815 when this character, William Smith, went around, made thousands of observations and produced a picture. And we're kind of still doing that now. And with knowledge graphs and new technologies, there's a new world opening up. And that new world is about visualizing observations themselves using knowledge graphs that enable analytics on that finer granularity. But if you're going to do this, then fair semantics are critical. One thing that few people realise that it's really worth revisiting the original paper of Wilkinson et al, where they emphasise, and it's all about machine readability of data, making data machine actionable. And as our friend said this morning, um, probably 95% of what's online is um, a claim to be fair, is at best findable and accessible by humans. It's definitely not machine readable. And above all, it's not interoperable or reusable. And so moving on to why they fail with the interoperability principle is the second one is blatant. It says metadata and data use vocabularies that follow the fair principles. That means they're available online, they're machine actionable. And as you know, most of the vocabularies we try and deal with, if we're lucky, they're a PDF online. Um, even where our vocabulary does have PIDs per term, the vocabulary itself, is not versioned or doesn't have a PID, and it's very hard to be able to machine to machine environment at site the exact version of a vocabulary that you use. And it can be hard, as I said, to access previous versions because usually you've just got one link for the whole lot. But one of the foundations we need to remember is that we want these things to be global. And there are two couple of things about that in that. Interoperability is dependent on the size of the community that firstly knows about your standard and secondly uses it. And that's a quote I pinched from Simon Cox from decades ago. And we do have this need to converge on standards for fair machine data, but um, this is really going to take time. And at the moment, because everyone's wanting to get into AI or machine learning or all sorts of uh, online analytics, they're just creating vocabularies and we say they're breeding like rabbits and they're all over the place. And this is just exacerbating our scenario of how can we make this um, more machine readable and more, more accessible. And I think above all, as I said to one group, well, the reason no one knows about your vocabs is if I go to your website, I've got to go down three levels to find it. I don't know about it. You don't go to conferences, you don't tell us about it. 
And so I was really lucky to be invited to be part of a group that became part of this World Fair. And what was even great was for some reason the EU, I'm not going to say lower their standards, I should say, changed their rules and allowed Australians and a few other countries to participate. And so Steve McGacken went in with the ADA and I'm working loosely with a group called One Geochemistry and we got in on it, we were able to get funding and be part of it. Mind you, the downside of that is anyone who's done a EU Horizon 2020 knows what the bureaucracy and project management overhead is. You wonder why the hell you did it. But to get more precise, um, as um, Arafat alluded to this morning, you can sort of see what we call the petals. So there's geochemistry, there's agriculture, cultural heritage, um, GBIF are in there, there's oceans, all sorts of groups. And so we're working within the domains, but under RFN and a couple of others' leadership, we're starting to work out, hey, how can you make this um, interoperable? So a lot of what RFN presented this morning was um, from this project. Now, one of the tools that they have started to use, and as you know, I've been trying to do interoperability of data for probably the last 25 years. I think maybe we've got the silver bullet and so they've picked up on a tool called a FAIR implementation profile that came out of the GoFair group. And the GoFair group has its roots in medical and there we're just totally at, we've got to get the data machine readable, how do we do it? So you can see on the right, it's just a simple Excel spreadsheet. That is the FAIR implementation profile. And for each one of the um, FAIR principles, it just asks you which model schemas do you use? What usage license do you have? So for each one of the principles, there's just a simple question and you can answer it in this Excel spreadsheet in free text. But you can go one step further and that is what we call a fair enabling resource. And this gets a little bit more sophisticated, but each principle can be linked to a fur which is a link to an online resource. So it can be a vocabulary. It can be um, the ISO 19115 metadata standard, or if you're using a profile of that standard, it is the link to what you're actually using for each one of the FAIR profiles. And so it's done in what they call a micro publication, but each FAIR must have a link in the real world and I've got a paper there that gives you more information. And um, to make it easier, this is a really new technology and it's not particularly stable operational, but one group developed this thing called the Fit Wizard, where you can go in and um, start to declare all your resources and publish it as a PDF Excel JSON. And the important thing about this is if you've got a community using it, you can go in like for the ISC, IGSN identifier. I went in with one group, oh, you're using IGSN. And straight away I knew who else was using a resource or a vocabulary that I'm using. So I knew we then had the grounds for doing machine to machine interoperability. So just quickly on one geochemistry, Angus mentioned it. And this is a informal amalgamation or group of um, quite a few of the major global databases and OzGeochem is in it along with um, EarthChem, which is a big American database and also GeoRock. And so we're trying to work out how we can get our data sets interoperable. And so we're starting to develop, so this is between EarthChem and GeoRock, just going through this simple question. Yeah, what are you doing? Finding out what the commonalities are and then hopefully getting them into FERS so that we can make the machine readable. And so you can see how if you do it across all the databases, you're starting to get somewhere. And even though a lot of people complain about Figshare and Zenodo because they're generic and they don't impose um, domain metadata or data standards, the thing is if the entry in Zenodo has a fit with it, then you know a lot more about that database as they become more standard. So um, I was also working on this project in geophysics, totally the other end of the spectrum, because you've gone from long tail to the big end of town. And I thought that was a bit easier because geophysicists tend to be a bit more literate than um, digitally literate than 
geochemist. Sorry, guys. I am a geochemist. I can say that. Um, and the aim of that project was to test what we had to think about if we wanted to make our geophysical data accessible on the exascale machines that are already in Europe and North America, what are we going to do? And the key conclusion was it has to be fully machine to machine. And therefore, we actually tried implementing the FAIR principles machine to machine in geophysical data. So we went through the same effort. Thank you, Jo. Um, she, she tried that fit wizard that's around and was able to generate the um, FAIR implementation profiles. We created a Zenodo community, which a bit ironic, within NCI to store these FIPS. And if you go to our catalog, you can see how you've got the access to the resource, but there again in yellow, you've got the FAIR implementation profile. So straight away, you'll download the data and here's the profile, which tells you all those nitty gritty things you wanna know about what darn vocabulary do they use or what formats the data in. And it's all there in a logical ordering. And so we hope to work that across um, all these geophysical domains in the coming years if this catches on. And I see it as an excellent tool for declaring what's going on. And so we come to our second final diagram in which I'm saying you've got local, we've talked about this, uh, Lizzie talked about taking local, moving them up into community. And ultimately we will have the global agreed vocabularies that takes time. But the critical thing to get fair vocabularies for all is to get people down at the lower levels, understanding what it means to publish a vocabulary, publish it properly using identifiers. And I think I agree with our friend this morning, this is so darn hard to do that if people know someone else has done it, then we'll get quickly going on the community resources. As Lizzie said, the drivers are there. And the important thing is that if you've already got something at tier three with the local vocabulary, you can just redirect the URIs of the terms that you're using as they come online. And so um, in conclusion, to accelerate it, I come back to it requires vocabularies that follow the FAIR principles. This is why I can pretty well say there's very few data sets in Australia that are genuinely FAIR because they fail that criteria. You, we need to get people to publish them in a reliable vocabulary service and make sure they're FAIR compliant with the PIDs. And even where you've got a vocabulary with URIs for the terms, make sure the vocab itself and the version of the vocab has a PID because that's what the FERS refer to and want to embed in the data set metadata and ensure that superseded versions can still be accessed, i.e. timestamped, so that the older data sets we can machine to machine get back to the terms that were used to make that data set fair. Thank you. So good afternoon, my name's Maggie Smith and I work within the data governance and catalogue team at Geoscience Australia. Uh, my colleague, Lara Sedgman, who leads the team, which publishes the vocabs is also here today and she was my standby. I know she's not pushing me out of the way. <laughs> so I'm speaking today from Ngunnawal country and I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of country throughout Australia and recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and community. And I pay my respects to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today and to elders past and present. I've made three presentations this year about the GA vocab refresh. So I apologize in advance for any repeated content. In the next few minutes, I'll be covering some background about GA vocabs, two example types that we're publishing, our policies, and finally, how fair our vocabularies are at the moment. So a vocab at GA is for communication both as human readable concepts and as machine readable, persistently identifiable link to terms being used in GA products. They're intended to be controlled lists managed by subject matter experts and published according to our existing approval and release process. They can also be international controlled lists that be referenced in GA products like country codes. Sorry, I'm going down a page. I can't move the words. 
Sorry, I need to read it. Um, apologies. Otherwise, I'll get completely off track and tell you how bad my flight's been the last two days. I'm just trying. Cool. See how that goes. So our vocabs can be a glossary, an alphabetical list of terms in a particular domain of knowledge, a data dictionary, structured data elements, and their metadata generally taken from a database table or a pick list, and a defined set of terms classified using a domain model with classes, subclasses, and subproperties. Currently, the most important thing about GA vocabs at the moment is the fact that it's being populated um, voluntarily, and um, there is no mandate for people to do that, so it's a, a big step forward for us. So I've chosen an example of vocabs that communicate database content. We have a catalogue policy aspiration that for data held in databases, which are not accessible for query or download, the metadata records are to be publicly facing and should include a data dictionary or snapshot of the database, as well as associations to delivery formats such as web services. In the record above, you can see that the download and links for the database contain links to web services, which don't deliver all the data from the database and in fact have their own metadata records as indicated in the associations tab. As of this month, we now also have links to an existing geological databases data dictionary PDF. So as Leslie mentioned before, we've got the good old PDF, which is better than nothing, and to the record for the vocabulary register. The existing geological databases data dictionary PDF was published in 2021 to support the delivery of web services by providing definitional information with the service. When you look at down, when you download the document, it describes the various tables. And here, looking at content character, you can see the format of the information and the database table identifier. This information is now available in the vocab register, which is identified as an associated record link. So looking at the same table in the vocab register, the parent terms are identified and the hierarchy is as you would expect it to be. The provenance is contained in the RDF but it's not displaying at the moment. We're going to be doing a small body of work in the future to update the information given on the landing pages so that it is actually in line with our metadata records in the catalog. So license, point of contact and any lineage will be displayed. In the process of communicating these database tables as vocabs, we've also been cleaning up duplications and spelling errors. And in the case of landform type, putting in definitions that were not previously given. The next steps will be to reference vocab terms in web services. And Aaron Stegeman is keen to give that a go, but there's a bit of work to do there yet. So we're also in the process of publishing the controlled code lists used in the catalogue, where we have extended the standard list. So in this example, the code list is for associations made between metadata records in the catalogue. If you look at the associations in this record, you can see that this vocab is part of the GA vocab collections record and that the list was informed by the GA metadata profile of the 19115. So as described in the abstract, this list contains the standard and extra terms used in the metadata standard. And when I was doing this presentation, I found out a mistake. Stereomate, which is the top term, should be camel case. So I'll have to go back and clean that up. The release of data is a well-known process at GA, and we're treating a vocab as a data set for the purposes of the cataloging process. So the vocab and publishing policy specify that before the vocab is created, there needs to be an identified custodian for the vocab, a community of practice supporting the content and the custodian, director approval to begin work, and that it's okay to release these terms publicly. And once the vocab's in the template, it's sent to the data and catalog team at the same time they begin the online publishing process. So the PRMT, no. PMRT is the creation of the metadata record for the catalog, the review of the metadata and product, and then the final approval to release. So this is a follow the bouncing ball type um, process that people follow. Um, the ECAT PID, which is generated on the completion of the, the metadata creation process is inserted in the RDF into the vocab. So there's a connection there as well. 
Um, the vocab creators could use RDF directly, but generally the VOC Excel template to document metadata about the vocab being created and the vocab itself seems to be popular so far in that everyone seems to be familiar with Excel. Once template is complete, they begin the publishing process, as I mentioned before, send the template uh, to us. And then at that point, I would be going through the template to look for consistency, normal spell checks and things like that, and where appropriate, getting rid of um, definitions that don't make sense, like template, template, those sorts of things. Um, okay, so that's going through, that's what the user sees as they go through the online publishing tool. And then I will take the template and put it, through, convert it to RDF, validate it just quickly to make sure I haven't missed anything obvious. And then um, I'll put it into the GitHub repository. Um, so I put that in as RDF and it's actually validated in the tool as well. So it gets a second validation, uh, which was interesting a while ago when it validated online, but didn't validate in our tool, but that's another story. Once it's put into the, um, gone through GitHub, it goes onto non-prod page. So a, a review page for the custodian to check that it is appearing as they expect it to. So we're adopting a very slow approach to promoting this service at the moment, but once the current vocabs in the backlog are published, so there'll be about 40 vocabs before we start um, approaching the rest of the organization to see if there's more to see. So how fair are our vocabs? So following the information given by Simon Cox in the fair vocabularies on GitHub, I'd say that our vocabs are fairly good using this general description. As I mentioned before, we're doing more work on the delivery system and the license will be obvious on the register and eventually the vocabs will also be downloadable in different formats. Going into a bit more detail from the same authors, I believe that we've got F and A covered, but could do better on the I and the R. So as I mentioned, or I mentioned after a long pause, GA is now gradually publishing persistent vocabs using VocPres. The vocabs are a communication of the terms and the definitions being used or referenced in products released by GA. Other benefits have been improvements in database definitions, that's what we found so far, and conversations with other state surveys about vocabs that GA are releasing in terms of geological databases. Vocabs are released via a standard well-understood data release process. Terms within a vocab and the vocab itself are persistently cited. The vocabs will eventually be discoverable at our RVA. I too have been um, annoying Rowan, not annoying, talking to Rowan. Um, and we're going to be cleaning up the existing, I think there's 14 GA vocabs sitting there at the moment. Um, we'll be cleaning those up. Um, if we extend a non-GA vocab that we reference, we will use the existing point of truth IRIs for the terms and then include the GA IRIs for any extension terms. And future ideas, obviously there's going to be a huge long list and it includes having more vocab metadata exposed, referencing the IRIs in metadata records for all code lists and keyword terms in the actual catalog. Um, web services incorporating vocab links into the service rather than just pointing at the PDF version. And having, as was mentioned in the last two presentations, having conversations to work towards creating community vocabs and potentially even the international ones, um, but we have to start somewhere. So at least we're putting things out there and we can start the conversation from there. Thank you. I'm Marty Klecking and I'm talking about collaboration between three major geochemical and cosmochemical data systems about how we're aligning and harmonizing our vocabularies. Um, so I'll be speaking about EarthChem and DGIS, which are both um, terrestrial geochemistry data systems, so dealing with, with rocks and minerals from Earth. And then the astromaterial data system is the, the cosmochemistry equivalent of that, um, dealing with chemical data, compositional data of meteorites and other astromaterials. Um, 
I'll mostly be speaking about the synthesis databases of these, these three data systems. Um, they're called AstroDB, GeoRock, and, and PetDB. And they compile data, chemical data, from the published literature. And this slide really is just to show that beside the, uh, the primary chemical analytical data, um, we also compile a large amount of metadata um, describing the, the samples and the, the, geo, the geographic locations that these samples come from, um, and the analytical methods as well. So just one, one example um, from GeoRock and PetDB. So this is the terrestrial side. Um, together, these two databases um, host over 30 million individual data and values. Um, so it's a huge amount of data I'm talking about here, um, collected over 25 years. Um, and the colors on this, this image are just showing different geological settings. Um, so beyond these synthesis databases, um, the three systems actually also do, do a bit more. Um, all three data systems host domain repositories. So they publish data that's submitted um, by, by researchers from the community. And these data would then flow into the synthesis databases. Um, and then pretty uniquely, um, EarthChem run the EarthChem portal, which is a combination of both the metadata and data from seven different um, distributed synthesis databases. Um, so GeoRock and EarthChem data are in here, GeoRock PetDB data, as well as um, a number of other databases. And up to this point, you might get away with not really worrying about your vocabularies too much. Um, but if you want to run a data portal like this, combining this many data from these many synth um, synthesis databases, you do really need to synchronize your vocabularies. Um, so this data portal is sort of the motivation behind the work that I'm, I'm presenting on today. Um, although, of course, it flows through all of the rest of our system architecture. Um, so GeoRock and um, PetDB, EarthCam, Digas have been collaborating for the last 20 years or longer. Um, but recently, uh, we came together again and decided to, to properly align all of our vocabularies and also bring Astromant on board with this. Um, so the goals are alignment of our vocabularies, extending those vocabularies to also integrate external standards where they exist, so where community authorities have published vocabularies, we want to include those. Um, we uh, obviously want to make them fair, so we want to make them accessible um, by publishing them on with, with RBA. Um, and we're also putting in place, uh, hopefully, a transparent and very flexible governance model that will allow for future changes and community revisions of these vocabularies. Um, so we've been doing this for, uh, for two years now, and it's really hard, <laughs> um, largely because we're just dealing with a very diverse, large set of communities and sub-disciplines within those. And really um, there's there's no global standards in geocosmic chemistry for anything. Um, everybody pretty much does does what they want within their their own little sub community. Um, and we often find multiple definitions of the same term and sort of conflicting complex hierarchy. So it's it's quite challenging to to combine and synthesize all of this information um, to serve all of these communities together. Um, so here's an overview of the, the, the ecosystem of vocabularies that we're dealing with. Um, this is not a technical drawing by any means, um, just an overview, but you can roughly uh, um, divide this into um, anything describing the, the sampling feature, so the geographical location of, of our samples and the physical samples themselves. Um, and then the analytical side of things, the observations and measurements, so the, the analytical methods, instruments, variables, units, etc. Um, so in green, I've highlighted vocabularies that where we can make use of external vocabularies that are machine readable. 
um, whereas blue are ones that we will need to um, partly design and certainly publish and make accessible ourselves. Um, so there are a number of bodies we can fall back on, um, but it still requires a lot of synthesis work as well, as I will explain um, next. Um, so I'm going to show you five examples of different vocabularies that we've been working on here now. Um, so first off, um, our poster child is the analytical methods. Um, this is work compiled by Steve Richard. Um, and this slide really just shows an example of the many different words used to describe one particular technique in geochemistry, which is laser ablation plasma uh, mass spectrography, mass spectrometry, ICPMS. Um, and all of these different terms basically refer to the same method. Um, so what Steve has done is aggregated all of this information and put it into a SCOS format. Um, which is really handy for our purposes, actually, in this case, because you can see we've got um, information coming from four different data system sources. In this case, we've obviously got a, a definition of what we're meaning with this term and, and the sort of standard notation. This is the LAIC PMS. Um, we've got our accepted name label, what we want to call it, but we can also preserve all of these other names. So we can preserve that information coming that's come from the literature compilation of our databases. Um, so this is great. This has been published on RVA in, in June earlier this year. And there's a link up the top in the QR code if you're interested. Um, and here's just the same LA or ICPMS example. Again, um, now both human and machine readable. Yeah. Example number two is minerals. Um, so in this case, we do actually have an external authoritative body. Um, there's the golden standard of the International Mineralogical Association, the IMA. They publish an approved list of minerals. Um, so this is amazing, but unfortunately, it's not quite enough for our purposes. Um, we have a lot of legacy data that isn't covered in this approved list of minerals. Um, and often people are really sort of sloppy when they describe um, what, they're, what they've analyzed, but also sometimes you just can't be as precise as this IMA list would like you to be. Um, and maybe most important of all, the IMA list is a PDF. Um, so this is where MINDAT comes in, um, which is a, a database of, of minerals. Um, predominantly, and they've had the Open MINDAP project through that. They've made all of their information um, accessible through their API, including the, the IMA list of minerals. Um, so we can now harvest those, those IMA terms um, and supplement them with other regular mineral names from, from the MINDAT database. Um, and then the plan is to publish our own implementation profile of mineral names on, on RBA. Example number three is lithologies and rock names. Um, and this really is, is very similar to the mineral story. There is an authoritative body, which is the International Union of Geological Sciences. They've got several subcommittees that deal with rock names and their definitions, but it's really hard to get a list, a comprehensive anything description of, of these, um, these rock names from, from the IUGS. Um, so there's a few machine readable representations or compilations done by some of the surveys. So the BGS is, is leading amongst, amongst those. Um, but again, it's not quite comprehensive. And it looks like we're, we're having to fall back on MINDAT yet again. Um, which conveniently doesn't only compile mineral names, but also rock names and, and their hierarchies. Um, so it's, it's looking like MINDAT will be our source of choice again. Um, now, fourth example is sample description. And these are two examples. There are many, many more vocabularies you can use to describe samples. I'm just showing the sort of the material um, and the sampling techniques here. Um, and this is an example where we really were starting from our compilations within the databases. You can see here we've in the source column, 
I've summarized, whether it comes from GeoRock or from the KTB database. Um, these are words used by the community in their papers. So we're synthesizing that, um, trying to harmonize that between our systems and then map um, to uh, more authoritative bodies like the iSamples project um, and CESA, which is an IGSN registration agent, um, to, uh, to come up with, with a sort of a community vocabulary that again will be published as our profile, implementation profile on RBA. Um, final example, taking you back to this map from the beginning, and the different colors on here are one of our vocabularies. So they're the, the geological settings, um, so distinct rock forming settings in a way. Um, and historically, uh, um, PETDB and GeoRock, which is where these data are from, dealt with different geological settings, which of course then meant that our individual list of geological settings were not compatible. So what we've now done is we've taken each of our lists, which are the first two columns here, and come up with a joint list of 22 terms that we are very both happy to map our existing um, concepts to. Um, so this is something that we will also publish on RBA in this new joint format. So I just wanted to finish on this slide from, from Kirsten Leonard, based on an idea by, by Leslie Wyborn on this three-tiered approach to vocabularies. So really, I think most of us are still in this bottom tier. We've got local vocabularies. If we're good, we will share them. We'll put a PDF on our website. Um, so what I've been talking about now is, is the community level where we've got three big data systems working together to come up with a common um, set of vocabularies. And that's already really hard to do. Um, but hopefully this will be the first step in eventually getting to a, a global set of fair vocabularies um, for geochemistry and, and other science disciplines. Um, so with that, thank you very much for your attention. And I look forward to your questions either in the chat now, um, or you can email me or any one of the, the free data systems that I've talked about. Thank you. All right. Uh, thanks for, uh, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Masoud Rahimi. I'm a senior data scientist from ORIN, Australian Urban Research Infrastructure Network. Uh, in this presentation, I reflect on ORIN's journey to facilitate semantic interoperability and support the creation, management, integration, and the use of fair data and metadata in urban digital twins. Uh, before everything, uh, I start this presentation by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which this event is taking place, and I pay my respect to elders past, present, and emerging. Let's have a brief introduction to ORIN first. ORIN is a national research infrastructure initiative aimed to provide researchers and decision makers with access to urban data and tools to support evidence-based decision making. Established in 2010, funded by NCRIS, uh, to provide nationwide digital research infrastructure. We have served more than 24K users, providing access to 5K data sets, uh, focusing on urban systems and regional centers. Uh, over the next five years, Orange focus uh, will be mainly on three key challenges of Australian cities and regional centers. Uh, this includes demographic transformation, energy transition, and climate change. Uh, to address those challenges, ORIN will bring together more granular, hard to get data sets from both public and private sectors uh, in a secure digital system. And this actually, uh, this is actually what ORIN is known for. We call this piece uh, ORIN's Urban Data as a Service, which is technically a service aimed to unlock, generate, curate, and share fair, hard to get data for urban and regional uh, research and planning. But this is not all we do. We're currently exploring opportunities for designing, developing, and maintaining a modular, scalable service for air and analytics. Moreover, building on top of urban data as a service and urban analytics as a service, Oren has been working on establishing what we call foundations for Australian urban digital twins, which generally aims to uh, 
uh, first ensure a lower transaction costs associated with building utilities for both private and public sectors, and second, support uh, and facilitate research output translation into this space. In line with this, Orin has been following the roadmap, and I'll provide more details on it in this presentation. Uh, uh, for each step, I'll briefly talk about what it is uh, and uh, the main challenges and gaps that we have identified in each of these steps. First, I draw on expense, uh, extensive experience uh, from the past national initiatives that Oren has been part of. This includes Livable Cities Digital Twins, LCDT, Other Pi, uh, Iris, Ozone Health, ATRC, AHDAP, uh, among others. Uh, for example, from LCDT, we learned that uh, urban digital twins are great, uh, are in great need of connectedness and linkage of data and tools, but the lack or weakness in semantic interoperability and standardization is a real blocker there. From IRIS, we learned that even the simplest data linkage can be non-trivial uh, due to data inconsistency caused by uh, evolving semantics over time. From other high, we learned that poor data accessibility due to technical and non-technical reasons is a real challenge, limiting the opportunity of data harmonization. Uh, from Ozen Health, we learned that utilities are mainly developed government-centric, while this leads to significant disconnectedness and making lots of data, tools, uh, data and tool silos. Now I expand on Oren's UDT testbed, which technically delves into domain of urban digital twins, assessing the market landscape and prototyping innovative UDT capabilities. Uh, some of the most important challenges identified during these initiatives were first, uh, uh, we learned that the lack of uh, proper semantic interoperability uh, hinders uh, discovering actionable knowledge, which is essential for utilities. Uh, second, we observe a significant high transaction cost on the back end of utilities. There has been important efforts uh, to uh, improve the front end of utilities, but handling fairness and heterogeneous data and tools, having a proper service architecture, and future proofing what we make. Uh, 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 these sort of stuff are mainly overlooked. There are significantly limited efforts on technological reusability and scalability. Uh, many definitions, concepts, and technologies on the back end of UDTs are emerging, and by the time you design a UDT, they might have already been drifted. Uh, and we also identified a broad range of available solutions, uh, which can be really confusing and uh, need to really be embraced and, ac and acknowledged. Uh, as part of our commitment to overcome the challenges identified in the national initiatives and uh, on the uh, uh, UDT testbed side, uh, we then moved to uh, the next step, which was our semantic interoperability challenge which was technically designed to uh, explore the complexities associated with uh, implementing this uh, semantic interoperability uh, 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 stuff into our current existing infrastructure. So there were two important challenges that we identified in this work. First, we observed that the progress in making uh, different UDT systems working together is mostly slowed down because there isn't a real to your financial benefit for it. Creating UDT systems can easily work with other, uh, 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 like creating UDT system that can easily work with other systems require lots of resources, integrated technologies and setting lots of standards. Uh, if the people involved don't, don't see a good financial reason to invest in these things, they are less likely to do that. 
they can't be learned that the heterogeneity in multifaceted, uh, the heterogeneity is multifaceted. It can occur in on different levels, semantic level, syntax, uh, syntactical level, structural level, and spatial temporal level. And leading to, uh, this, can, uh, this can be leading to significant complexity in handling uh, uh, interoperability. Finally, Orin has recently commenced its Unity community. And uh, we have been driving collaboration as a central role by participating in important conferences and discussions such as this one, Locate uh, Research Australasia. Uh, our collaboration efforts uh, also involves working closely with some important partners from research, industry, and government, uh, such as OGC, CSR, Data61, Wulpert, Kurawange, uh, RMIT University. Some of the most important uh, uh, challenges that we identified is the fact that interoperability is really complex and multidimensional, and such a multidimensional problem needs multifaceted solution. And we need to acknowledge that making different systems uh, from different domains seamlessly working together may not it may not be uh, even feasible in many cases, and there may never be the case of perfect fairness. And third, uh, there is a significant resistance in various communities to calculate the fairness of their data, probably a result of concern about a complexity involved in the area, uncertainties, uh, or probably not knowing even an easy tool or standard methodology for such assessment. And finally, uh, efforts to our units of semantic interoperability have been mostly government-centric rather than being human-centric. This actually limits its widespread adoption and implementation of, uh, of their benefits across different sectors and communities. Uh, with that opening, uh, I can now discuss some of the lessons learned by Orin and its partners. So first, we need to acknowledge that interoperability has various aspects. It has legal aspects, licenses, agreements, regulations. It has organizational aspects credentials, authorization, it has semantic aspects, uh, all the conceptual and logical models and technicals, a API, specification schemas, all of this can highlight the need for collaborative efforts of people from different domains and different experts coming together. Uh, also, we need to acknowledge that uh, we need to have a sort of a model for value proposition. Uh, this is essential and we need to ensure that interoperability has a clear gain creator. Uh, this can easily be translated into the current demand on the UDT market, uh, uh, which is a great opportunity to actually uh, bring that, that sort of opportunity, uh, bring that sort of potential into, uh, uh, into the uh, semantic inter interoperability space and uh, bring that sort of uh, benefits across different sectors and communities. Also, whatever we do on the UDT should move from government-centric, yep, uh, two minutes. Sure. Whatever we do on the UDT uh, should be moved from that government-centric perspective to a more human-centric perspective. Uh, that ensures that our solution prioritizes the needs, experiences, and well-beings of citizens as the main customers of the city. And also, we need a sort of a, 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 a procedure for constant evaluation of fairness. We know that fairness can change over time. And uh, we need to uh, uh, be ready for that and uh, constantly evaluate fairness. And also, we need to uh, acknowledge that there will never be the case of perfect fairness. So uh, what's uh, important here uh, is even a small effort, like a five minute uh, uh, work can help make our data more fair. Uh, we need to uh, acknowledge that uh, there is this uh, diversity uh, between different standards, and uh, we need to uh, create a balance between how much a standard we want to enforce and how much standards we don't want to uh, enforce. Uh, and also, we should understand the landscape and map all of this together. And also, uh, uh, this also applies for tools and all the other solutions. Uh, control vocabulary uh, uh, depends on involvements of user communities. Uh, so this is very important to have that sort of community. 
And also we need to really go beyond the spatial data uh, uh, to actually uh, get to that point that Uritis can uh, do some actionable uh, uh, items. And this, uh, this also highlights the need for semantic interoperability. So uh, we believe that semantic interoperability is the core for enabling Uritis since it's, it's uh, that Piece, uh, that piece of puzzle that brings urban data as a service and urban analytics as a service together. And uh, we recently secured a budget of $25 million and there is more funding coming uh, in our way. Uh, so based on this, Oren aims to bridge uh, these gaps and these challenges and opportunities by uh, being an early adopted, adopter of the best practices, bringing researchers, industries, governments, together hosting that sort of conver uh, conversation, aligning the efforts and supporting innovative solution. Uh, if you're interested in what Oren is doing uh, on the Unity side on the semantic interoperability, if you'd like to hear more about us, please scan this QR code, which is also available on the next slide and uh, fill in the form and we will get back to you. Uh, yep, that's pretty much it. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present. Uh, and as I'll say, it's a wonderful segue after the first one um, in terms of exploring techniques for, for addressing the human-centered aspects of fair uh, practices and care practices. So in, in this presentation, we wanna talk about some of the, the ways that the lessons we've learned from, from our work in, in a number of different communities to try to build more careful vocabularies. And um, before we begin, would like to, on behalf of Ruth and myself, uh, pay our respects to the traditional owners and custodians of the lands on which all of us are walking, working and living. I'm coming to you today from Guy Magal land. Um, Ruth is close by. Uh, and we'd also extend that respect to all First Nations people who are listening. Yeah, Camaragal land, land here. Thank you, Ruth. So uh, a, a big part of what we're going to talk about can be summarized in, in two statements, one naming matters and data matters. And I, I put up this, this quote from Mary Ellen Capek. This is a, a statement that came out of a work in the 1980s about the power of language and um, how as an intimate and political activity, uh, naming actually shapes and defines our institutions and our structures uh, I'm familiar with, with Mary Allen's work because when I was training librarians many decades ago, we were working with transformations of the Library of Congress subject headings. So these are not new phenomena, but they are uh, acutely critical, I think I would argue, or we would argue right now, because of the increased use of data technologies and, and AI and big data contexts where where um, there are risks involved in magnifying uh, the limitations of language or um, inappropriate or, or biased uh, approaches. So uh, what we are talking about here uh, builds on the care principles that come out of the Global Indigenous Data Alliance. Uh, and, and I'm very fortunate to be able to be collaborating with some people as part of the World Fair project, looking specifically at global health and the different ways that be fair and care um, messaging and training can, can inform the work of data professionals who are working in that domain. Ruth and I have been collaborating in, in connecting on fair and care principles in relation to the work we've been doing with the public service, looking at um, data collection and data analysis in government, local and state government contexts. And so really what we're doing is we're taking these care principles and we're seeing them as serving, not just as guides for dealing with indigenous data, but really serving as valuable guides for a more inclusive and participatory practice uh, across all communities. And so that's what we wanna talk to you about briefly today. Uh, and, and it's really about how do you, how do you put this into practice? How, if you seek to be fair in care, how do you create a culture of care? So in our, um, in our experience, what, what we have found is really important is in the first instance to, to really make sure that you are paying attention 
not just to the technical considerations, which so often demand our attention, but really giving time um, and space to the social and the cultural as well. And it's one thing to say that, it's quite another to make sure that, that they are respected and they are given um, the time and the space. It's also then important to recognize that the shaping of, of good practice and responsible practice, as we are so often doing through standards and frameworks, is not a set and forget practice, but rather it is an ongoing and ever evolving process. And so, so that dynamics is, is also important to address and, and uh, brings its own challenges. And, and so in our ways of working, what we've sought to do is to apply a socially sensitive approach that in the first instance looks to make sure that we're creating two-way streets that allow for authentic feedback uh, and co-design. So not only making sure that we are uh, careful in the way that we are taking data or, or creating the, the ways of categorizing and classifying, but also making sure that we give that data back and set up the, the, uh, the two-way street to allow for that um, genuine engagement. And then you're looking to make sure that you are designing and maintaining um, the, these aspects in a very inclusive as well as actionable way. And before you even go in, making sure that you have permission to apply the language and the measures from another context. So, so that is very much about putting into practice a human-centered approach. And it's important because it helps to establish the legitimacy of what you were doing, making sure that you can do the work that you're seeking to do in the first place. But there's another element to that, which is really important if we are going to put fair principles into practice. And that is a metacognitive one that is about um, helping us to really be mindful of, of our own practices, our own assumptions, um, our own skills. And this is really essential if you're going to seek to address unconscious bias, for instance. So uh, yeah, I like using this image um, that I took uh, some years ago uh, because the, the, the way that we learn to look beneath the surface is a nice uh, metaphor for thinking about ways of making the invisible visible and trying to get a sense of what, what can be made visible and what may not be able to be made visible. So if you were walking out to a reef, uh, it would take you a while to, if you stood very still, allowed the water around you to get still, uh, allowed your eyes to adjust, uh, you would start to see more deeply. You would start to understand and have a more intimate appreciation. Um, and this is this goes back to care principles and, if you like, the lessons that have come from Indigenous data sovereignty uh, communities or those who are working in that space, Indigenous technologists, who, who will talk about Indigenous practices and ways of connecting and, and making time and making space. And so that seems a really powerful way of allowing us to be in a position to capture and locate language um, appropriately and to deal with, with its dynamics. So putting that together, we, we reference quite a lot this idea of making the invisible visible and the power of enriching the process through a number of different uh, techniques um, to really bring that home. So one of the first uh, things to keep in mind is taking the time to think and to link. So this would mean appreciating the context. It means making time to think on your own about what it is that you are bringing, what are your strengths, as well as your potential uh, blind spots to limitations. Uh, thinking about ways that you can meet communities on their own ground and then making the time for that meeting and not um, sticking to your own timetable, but rather responding to the needs of, of the community and, and their practices. Uh, and when you're dealing with multiple communities, then this magnifies those challenges further. Uh, and then it's important to think about your naming practices, to think about the different ways of mapping contexts, and again, to allow the flow and dynamic unfolding of those situations. And through that process, you start to develop the skills for co-creation that are really important for accommodating those multiple interpretations. Uh, and you also, by developing a practice, a habit of making the invisible visible, you also learn to show your work, um, which then helps build up the evidence that you need to help yourself and others to understand the decisions that you've been making. So I'm going to turn it over to Ruth. 
Thank you very much, Teresa. That was a really good um, overview and introduction and some of the things that we've been uh, playing around with the, over the last few years. Um, and metaphor is a very important one. So one of the things we're really looking at is how can we um, <clears throat> change skill sets um, to, to address some of the uh, issues around evolving semantics and semantic interoperability and, um, and some of the concepts that, that Teresa was also talking about in terms of bringing the care principles into, into the process as well. Um, and metaphor is a very good way of doing that. It helps people um, take them out of the context that they're actually were actually working in where they have really heavily already value laden interpretations for some of the um, terminology that we're using. And it also allows us to meet on a common ground and have a shared meaning through um, some other shared experience. And it helps people sort of reinterpret through that, um, through that sort of externalization process, um, some of the concepts they work with every day in, in data. Um, and uh, so we've both worked a lot with, uh, with metaphor, um, data as water. In this case, I'm gonna talk about data as food. And, and indeed, also Teresa, in one of in her previous life, um, uh, also uh, launched a little program that was inspired by, very much inspired by this excellent uh, quote at the top of this slide: "Raw data is both an oxymoron and a bad idea." To the contrary, to the contrary, data should be cooked with care. Um, in meaning, uh, well, it's fairly self-evident. And uh, she introduced uh, an exercise for her master's students at UTS using the uh, the Master Chef Mystery Box Challenge as a, uh, Ruth, a sort of message. Uh, Ruth, for that. just two minutes. Two minutes, okay. I'll move very quickly. So one of the things that we've been doing through looking at metaphor again um, is is coming up with ideas for allowing people to think about what they're doing in their day to day work um, with data. Uh, and the import of that. And in, in order to try and really stretch their understanding and, and to build their understanding of, of, of day-to-day -day activities with data and data governance and, uh, and uh, co-creation and, and really try and understand how they sit within that and how they can improve their practices and, and think about them differently. And one of them is using the responsible services data concept, which is obviously for any Australian would know, we have a, uh, a responsible service of alcohol requirement that every uh, anybody working in a licensed premises has to do before they're allowed to serve alcohol. And uh, we're very much borrowing from that and, and feeling that that needs to be done with data as well. Uh, and we've also been playing around with developing sort of um, experiential sort of integrated um, um, learning experiences using that metaphor um, that people can actually um, sort of streamline into the work that they're doing. So that as they go through their usual practices, planning your meal, obviously being your, doing your project management um, and getting your plans in place, looking at your requirements and who your users are, taking you out of your, uh, I know this space, I'm a data practitioner, into this other metaphor so that you can really think uh, in, a, in, a, in a more holistic and different way about what you're doing. And the context is everything. So as you'll see in the last of these, what are you, who are you cooking for? Thinking about your data subjects, who, who is going to benefit and what. Really thinking about the, the um, the words that you're using, the vocabulary that you're employing, and whether you're meeting, whether whether that same vocabulary is shared by by that community. And again, you can take that same concept through, and and we do here to um, the semantics and and meaning of um, data products and data outcomes, and how we have, can evaluate that, and whether we're on the same terms as the data subjects and and the rest of the community that we're that we're working with. So um, then the last part to that concept, and this is something we're still playing with and experimenting with, is uh, the final piece of context, which is very important here, is obviously the person, the practitioner themselves. How are they interpreting uh, some of these concepts? What are they um, contributing in the way of semantics and definitions? Um, and what are the great superpowers that they might be bringing to this, which actually give them some advantages, but also the things that we're calling kryptonites that may be slowing them down, that may be changing the way in which they interpret uh, the information um, and what have you, 
also taking people through that reflective process through um, to learn new habits about showing your work, which is what Teresa was talking about earlier, being able to actually show your thinking process through all of these steps and just to be able to justify those process, uh, your decisions as you go through. Uh, and then we're also playing around with getting expert feedback to those to see how in how that will improve people's speed and quality of learning of, of new data practices through um, expert um, feedback. So um, I think I'm sort of more or less out of time. So if anyone wants to follow up with either of us, our details will be in the slide deck. Um, and I'm certainly very happy to reach out. There's um, quite a few things, um, resources we could point you to in, in, along the lines that we've been thinking. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I'm talking to you today from the land of the Bunurong people of the Kulin Nation, and I'd like to express my respects to their elders, past and present. I'd also like to apologise in advance. I was hit yesterday by a rather nasty upper respiratory tract infection, and I hope I won't dissolve into fits of coughing at some time during my presentation. The Language Data Commons of Australia project has been developing a metadata vocabulary for our work. We started mainly on the basis of work done about 20 years ago in the Open Language Archive community. Uh, they, of course, from the name, it's fairly obvious, they're part of the broader Open Archive community. So the work they did started from a Dublin core base, although when you look at what we're doing, probably not so easy to pick that up. But uh, there was also input from other kinds of projects, particularly uh, back then, 20 years ago, particularly from a project called Electronic Metadata for Endangered Language Documentation. The people involved in that work came from a particular, what tended to come from particular subfields of linguistics, descriptive linguistics, language documentation. And they were thinking primarily about a vocabulary they needed to describe language other than English languages spoken in small communities and so forth. Uh, and that means that there are some places where the vocabulary the, that they developed has some quite obvious holes in it. So, for example, they have terms to describe various kinds of linguistic genre, which includes things like formulaic language and ludic language. But when we were trying to describe some government documents, we realised there was no term there just to talk about documents which or pieces of language which conveyed information, and we had to add that kind of term. So we worked on that basis. We've started from what was there. We've added classes and properties and terms as we need them. Our first preference is to look for things at schema.org. If there's nothing suitable there, we'll look for other linkable sites but some things inevitably are what we devise ourselves. The vocabulary that we're working with is available initially, at least in two formats. So there's a JSON-LD version, and, which is the machine readable version, and there's documentation that's automatically generated from that. And I'll show you what they look like in a second. And both of those are available from a GitHub repo. So this is a little kind of JSON LD version, and that's the corresponding uh, text version that's generated from that. Now we have to ask ourselves the question: Is this actually enough? These versions of what we're doing. If we can persuade people to use the vocabulary, there are obvious benefits there for data managers, for developers, people working on the more technical side, but we hope that it should also have benefits for our users. And the benefit that we should get for our users is to make the data fair or more fair. And if people understand how we're using the vocabulary, we think that we can improve thing, that in two areas. First of all, we can help people find data efficiently. And secondly, we can help people to describe their data so that other people can find it more efficiently. But as I said, this is um, work that's going back over 20 years. 
uptake of vocabularies for describing language data has been pretty poor. I'm a linguist by background. I'm as guilty as the next person probably in this regard. But the history of these kinds of endeavours in our discipline has been fairly dispiriting. There have been a range of different schemes that have been proposed at different times. So there's the OLAC scheme we've been working with. There was another schema called the General Ontology for Language Description. It was the IELTS Metadata Initiative, which kind of morphed into the Component Metadata Initiative. And none of these has been extensively adopted. I'll give you a specific example of a situation where there are very obvious advantages for adopting a particular vocabulary and still didn't really happen. I can mention something called the Leipzig Glossing Rules, which is a proposal from the Max Planck Institute in Leipzig about how linguists could provide glosses for grammatical categories when they were presenting data. So this is things like number and tense. They, the Leipzig people proposed around 200 items that could be included in the list. And in the end, general usage is restricted to a very small subset. People are happy to use the number one for first person, the number two for second person, the abbreviation SV for singular, and PL for plural. But beyond that, it falls away very quickly because people say, well, my past tense is not exactly the same as your past tense. And therefore, we don't want to use the same label. As I said, there were obvious advantages in adopting this kind of proposal. Apart from anything else, it stopped. It would have meant that people basically did not have to prepare abbreviation lists for their publications, which I think is a very significant benefit. But it still didn't get picked up. So we have decided that we could try and find some other way to improve uptake of what we're doing. And the way we're trying to do that is to provide additional resources. We use terms from our vocabulary for displaying records in our data portal. So the first problem I mentioned is very relevant. Are the people who are looking at those records understanding how those terms are being used? And we also provide advice to people on how they should be going about collecting language data. And then the second problem is relevant because obviously we recommend people should use our vocabulary so that other people are going to be able to find and access that data and use it. So we also have to ask ourselves, do the people who are collecting data understand the terms we're using and how to apply them? In order to try and meet these needs, then we're, as I said, creating another resource. We're documenting our vocabulary in much greater detail than the automatically generated documentation. And we're doing this using Hitbook. The reason that we chose that medium is firstly that it gives you a low cost in terms of our effort. It gives us a presentation style and a layout that is accessible, familiar for at least most of our users. It looks like a book. The, as I said, relatively low cost for us, the editing interface and the procedures are straightforward. We don't have to start from scratch. There's a lot of stuff there for free and you end up with a nice product. And also, as much as one can make predictions about these things, this delivery platform seems like it's reasonably stable. We can hope that it will be there for quite a while without us having to put a lot of maintenance effort into it. But if there were any problems, it's easy to export what we have there into PDFs or Markdown, and then we could reuse it in another context. Now, I'll show you a couple of examples of the kind of additional content that we're providing here. Uh, three different kinds, specifically. One is explanation, one is usage examples, and one how we refer to things in the literature. Here's an example where we've given fairly detailed explanation. I, I should um, emphasize, please do go, do go and look at the book site, but uh, it's work in progress. I'm showing you some of the better developed examples. And there's a lot of pages which don't have this kind of extra information yet. We're still working on it. So here we have 
quite a detailed explanation of one term and how we apply it. The OLAC on which it was based, their comment says that it's a, a struct, it's structured link, an annotation is structured linguistic information aligned to some extent of another linguistic record. We've given a slightly more general uh, definition as the base. Resource includes material which adds information to some other linguistic record, which is very general. And then we explain this in a little bit more detail. We talk about what OLAC might have meant by alignment. And we talk about some of the tools that people could use to produce alignment, some of the kinds of formats that result from that different kinds of annotation, different kinds of annotation documents that result. And we give a little bit more discussion in one particularly salient example for a lot of linguists, which is transcription. What's the relationship between a recording or a video of people interacting and some kind of extra information provided as an annotation? And we're suggesting that the transcription just kind of record the words or the whatever aspect you want of the interaction, kind of record that is already an annotation. Uh, Simon, so that's, that's one and, uh, Simon, that's one and a half minutes yeah, to go. Sure. So that's the kind of level of explanation we'd like to provide. Here's an example where we go into some detail about usage. So we might we make a distinction between subject language and in language. And this is between the, the language, which is the actual medium that a resource is using to communicate with people, and subject language is what's being talked about, which can be different. And here we give an example of how this would apply in the case of a work about Italian language as used in Australia, but which was written in English. So its in-language value is English, but its subject language value is Italian. And then we also, as I said, aim to give people references to additional literature. Uh, the, you may not be familiar with the concept of whistle language, but this does exist in various places around the world. This is a place where we haven't yet had the chance to add in explanation or usage notes, but we do at least have a reference where you can go and find out more about this slightly strained phenomena. So those are the kinds of information we're trying to give people to make our metadata vocabulary more accessible and encourage them to use it. So we, we want to maximize the benefit we get from this vocabulary. And as I've just said, to achieve that, we hope to make it as accessible as possible to the people who are going to use our products and our services. And to make this possible, to make the vocabulary accessible, we're developing this rich of documentation with explanations, examples, and references to literature. And Gitbook seems like a good way to do this because it's so easy to edit and create the content, and because for a low cost, we're getting pretty good production values, and as I said earlier, a format which is familiar and therefore accessible to our users, who are not necessarily the kind of people who jump on GitHub on a daily basis to look for information. Thank you. Thank you very much, the organizers of the conference, that is the Australian Search Data Commons. Thank you for welcoming me to this uh, vocabulary symposium. I am going to speak just in brief or from a socio-economic point of view, the essence of uh, indigenous uh, data custodianship and governance, looking at frozen pathways and, an, and unknown civilizations, how indigenous data is significant. So we are defining in our discussion, we are defining uh, indigenous data, what it is. This is critical information that we have in any nation, in any given community, within even a family, you can trace it, this critical indigenous data. It is information that you get, which is critical for the existence of that society. And it is the one on which processes 
are managed. It can be uh, categorized into social, uh, biological sciences, natural sciences, engineering sciences, depending on how uh, development frontiers are changing within a community and also depending on the level of development of that community. The indigenous data um, uh, governance uh, speaks of the way this data is managed and how all these other groups in the circles that I have indicated, social, biological, engineering, sciences, how they are they contributing. So you have uh, correspondingly those categories. And I think we in our country in Zimbabwe and in uh, Southern and Sub-Saharan Africa, we are still in the process, I think, of coming up with this um, area of constructing uh, this critical indigenous data, which is culturally founded, historically founded, uh, uh, regardless of those the classes that I have, I have indicated. The other issue that we may uh, want to understand here is why uh, custodianship or governance of, of data. It is very critical for identity of an individual community for identity of a nation, of a country, and for defining the levels of scientific progress that a country is registering. That's the only level of a country. But again, to the extent a country or a community is part of the global community, it is also critical that governance of data, uh, indigenous data, it is also very critical for uh, exchanging value with other communities across the world. In other words, it's critical for bridging the gaps that may be existing within the social, economic cycle, bi biological cycle. Now we have space technology and we have nuclear technologies also, and we have the challenges of climate change, as we all know, that uh, need the sharing of this knowledge. So indigenous knowledge sometimes if it is not well developed, it gets a kind of a compensatory, I think, dimension from the international dimension we are talking about, that it needs not only be national, but even an international dimension where um, common humanitarian issues will be discussed, and therefore the need for that indigenous knowledge to have also the international dimension. What are the major characteristics of this uh, uh, indigenous data. It should not be limited to the community or the nation itself because it becomes very misleading in that case. You sort of divorce yourself from other processes uh, that from which humanity is already benefiting across the world. There are aspects of indigenous uh, data, uh, the characteristics that are quite critical for it to remain relevant uh, to the community, the first being limitation. It must not uh, be subject to limitation, in other words, limited to only a small group of people or limited only to the nation. But it must be one that is, uh, if inward looking, but it must also have an outward orientation so that the community the nation is part of the global community. The other issue that is very critical is there must be balance, balance between what is closed and what is open data within a, within a community or within a nation. For how long that data, which is specific to a community or a nation, for how long it will be closed? For when will it be open? Right. Under what circumstances? Right. All those dimensions, they are needed. But you also, like I said, want to uh, identify yourself within a progressive um, world that is moving on. So you, the, dimen the dimension to share is always very critical. What is the other issue that we have uh, discussed in our, in, our, in our paper, in our submission to the Australian Research Data Commons? One of the critical uh, uh, 
aspects or characteristics of indigenous uh, uh, indigenous knowledge, this indigenous data, it's, it must not uh, have uh, the uh, the limitation aspect. It should be open-ended. But also very critical is to know which data and from which sector, from which area is to be shared, which is not to be shared. There must be time frame also on uh, how long it should not be shared and how long can it be open uh, and it be open now uh, to the public. The other issue that we uh, is quite critical for, um, for indigenous data is uh, its commercialization. We have, we have seen nations actually during the time of COVID exchanging this data, uh, these drugs that are made. It's part of the dialogue that is going on uh, on, um, on, on, on indigenous data. When that data is uh, availed, the drugs themselves, the data when it is availed, we have a lot of advances also in other sciences that is going on on climate change, space technology, nuclear technologies. It's all to do with indigenous data and the critical information that must be, um, that must be secured or kept uh, through these governance mechanisms you are talking about. But however, in conclusion, uh, ladies and gentlemen, allow me just to say, whatever the case, indigenous data should be meant in the final analysis, I think, for social progress, for common, for the common human good. It must be data that is meant for peace, for change and transformation of communities, I think, to make this uh, world uh, worth living by all. Thank you very much. Merry Christmas and a prosperous 2024 Blessed New Year. Thank you. Hello everyone, good morning. My name is Janet Ba. I work at GAZES, the Leibniz Institute for the Social Sciences. Uh, thank you for having me here today to present in the Vocabulary Symposium. And I'm going to present a work on um, controlled vocabulary for uh, relations between variables across waves and studies. Hi, I am Janet Ba. I work at GAZES and I'm going to present today our work, which is Enhanced Fair Compliance, a controlled vocabulary for mapping social sciences survey variables. So here are the authors. Uh, it's me, Janet Ba, Klaus Peter Klaus, and Peter Mudski. The three of us work at GAZES as well. Uh, so our agenda will cover the main points, so the context and motivations, the variables relations, and the controlled vocabulary proposed. We also address the topic with the knowledge graph and discuss a bit about some open questions and provide some next steps. So regarding context, motivations, and goals, this controlled vocabulary was developed in the context of PID, Registration Service for Variables. Uh, this is a service deliverable for Consort SVD, which is uh, funded by the German uh, National Research Data Infrastructure, NFDI. So Consort SVD is a consortium funded by the NFDI in Germany, and this our task area will deliver a service to assign PIDs or persistent identifiers at a more fine-grained level, such as dataset elements, in which our first approach uh, is available within a dataset. So our first motivation is uh, the fact that in the social sciences survey, there is this dynamic relationship among studies units and surveys instruments, uh, especially considering these entities like questionnaires, variables, questions, and responsive format uh, evolving across waves and studies. The second motivation is that the variables of data set relations enable compatibility across waves of a given study. Uh, for example, we are considering here a data set element, a variable, and this variable is within a data set in a rectangular or um, a tabular format. So from wave one uh, and two, uh, this given variable could have many changes. So for example, uh, from wave one and two, uh, the same variable was reused with a different name or a different label which is the reference of the variable, uh, a different question wording, 
which is very common, especially to address differences in response schema as well. So you can have a variable with a response schema, for example, a Likert scale 5, and then in the next wave, you need to extend it to a Likert scale 7. So this is very important from the researcher's standpoint and when they are making decisions uh, on how and which data to reuse. Another motivation is that the current relations type descriptions uh, do not represent the, this complexity of variables in the, the social sciences. So although current uh, frameworks like DGI or data sites try to model these relationships, they fall short in addressing all of this complexity in the social sciences. For example, here we have this DDI controlled vocabulary for common types, and it tries to provide codes and terms to describe these relationships. And there are three codes here available, identical, sum, and none. Let's take a look in this uh, code such as sum, which is not enough to disambiguate these relations, because when you see the description, uh, it uses sum when compared items have similar but not identical content. Uh, for variables, for example, some of the elements of the variable descriptions, name, label, question, uh, category, codes, and so on, will identical in form, while others will be different. Okay, but exactly which of those elements are different. So this is not enough to disambiguate these relations. So this uh, is why we are coming up with these goals to describe relations between variables across waves. First, within in the same study, then describe connections across variables from different studies because there are many variables that are connecting uh, across studies. Describe relations type for better semantics across and between variables in the social sciences. Finding relations inherited within DDI instructions, structure among all other possible entities. I will show it later. Uh, and store these relations across variables within our metadata that are registered when um, a PID is assigned to a, at a variable level. So to fulfill these goals, we are describing these variable, uh, variables relations, and we start demonstrating or illustrating these elements. Uh, then we start with the study, and then the study has uh, some waves. So the same survey or instruments are repeatedly across years uh, used to get new data. Uh, all of these instruments also uh, they have a bunch of questions, and each question has a response schema or a response scale, uh, which can be changed from one wave to another. Uh, and we are proposing this controlled vocabulary to explain these relations across waves and studies. And then to provide these uh, descriptions, we published our controlled vocabulary in Chesda uh, Vocabulary Service. Then it's called Gaze Controlled Vocabulary for Variables Relations for Social Science Research Data. Uh, here is the link. You can also, here is the link, but you can also find it in the description of this uh, presentation. So we provide a brief textual identification of this uh, relation type supported by a controlled vocabulary with an extended description of the relationship. So, for instance, the connections for variable versions, derived format, different labels, question wording, everything we have talked so far. And it's also important to highlight some assumptions on our project requirements because we are aware of um, about the data DDI modeling, the variable cascade, but we are now focused only on variables within data sets or the instance variables because we only get variable metadata for registration of the PID, so no other entity has been registered. Now I will give a brief overview about variables relations for knowledge graph. So a knowledge graph holds descriptions of entities and their interrelations. It's organized in a graph. Uh, it's built on established standards like that, uh, such as uh, W3C, RDF, uh, makes entities and their interrelations machine interpretable. 
and of course uses uh, persistent identifiers. So since these variables, um, they have now persistent identifiers, then uh, it's uh, feasible to use them in order to build a knowledge graph for the social science. In terms of visual representations, of these knowledge graphs, we have here the first example, which is the variable name. So we have seen this um, example before, but now in terms of a knowledge graph, we have the study program. And then we have uh, here the waves one and two, and each wave has a different data set, and each variable resides in this uh, data set. And here, the predicate or the relation between these two variables it's a different name. And then we can express this difference here. So the variable one or the first variable uh, used to be uh, the variable name was to be age. And now the second variable, which is being registered, uh, has an updated in this uh, element or in this attribute. The second example is the question wording, uh, which is also very common. Uh, here, the question wording was changed, for example, uh, to uh, comply with, um, here in this case in Germany, to comply with a language um, requirement in terms of using or not using special characters. The second one is, uh, sorry, the third one is the response schema. So again, I have two waves and then I have two data sets and then I have two variables because each variable resides in a different data set. And here, Question one and two, um, the questions can be the same or can be different because I'm talking about the same variable, but then the second variable uses or extended the response scale from Likert, uh, Likert's uh, scale five, which was used in the first variable, and then here it's using Likert scale seven. So what are the advantages? Uh, for these uh, knowledge graphs. Uh, well, once once we document and describe these variables relations, we can support search and browser functionalities. Uh, we can also enhance data we're using, especially uh, through these search and browser functionalities, researchers are able to find these connection, connections in a visual manner. And uh, of course, allows uh, comparison uh, across data sets. Uh, it facilitates a harmonization process. Uh, using this proposed controlled vocabulary can create a semantically rich common social science knowledge graph. So uh, across institutes, we can also start using the same controlled vocabulary, uh, which are in line with the FAIR principles. Um, and here there is um, a work where the, um, some uh, automatic filters are explained and this knowledge graph can also be used to uh, data access in R. So open questions. We have some questions that are still open. So for example, data set versions. Uh, we have variables that are packaged in different data products, even though they are the same, but they are packaged differently. So we can uh, provide, for example, basic versions, uh, extended versions, versions with some aggregated data from another study, uh, some uh, data sets that re are restricted because of some privacy information or privacy, privacy issue, then uh, we would need, in this case, a relation type with the data set itself, uh, linking the variable PID with the uh, data set DOIs. But we are still... Um, questioning or wondering if we would need any type of different relations uh, descriptions or relations uh, name for that. Questions sublevels. This is are also something that we we had encountered. So for example, the question sublevels means that the question itself has many parts or many levels. We have the questions team, it's a pretest, a statement that came, that came um, before the question itself, the question text itself, some questions prompts, it's called 
for example, any information regarding the instructions on how to answer. So consider uh, which level do you agree with this statement? Um, and do we need to break down the relations for the questions of levels as well? A survey mode is also an open question. So uh, depending on, on the mode, paper-based, online-based, interview, face-to-face, -face, it can also um, require some modifications in the variables. For example, question wording in a paper format is written, go to question 10. But then if you use the same survey in an online mode, this um, instruction is not necessary anymore because the software or the, the survey, the online survey will jump uh, automatically for the next necessary question. So to summarize what we have talked, uh, we presented the motivation behind the relations uh, between variables. We published our first version uh, on CHESDA Controlled Vocabulary Managed Tool. Uh, we provided some examples based on Gaze's data set. Uh, our next steps is continuing the discussion. Please join me if you, if you would like to collaborate, if you would like to provide some feedback, we are eager to hear, to hear them. Uh, validate and extend the second version uh, on CHESDA Controlled Vocabulary Manager 2. Extend the controlled vocabulary. We want to describe links across different, uh, not just different waves, but also different studies and other entities. And we would love to foster this controlled vocabulary reuse among uh, social sciences institutions and uh, build our first knowledge graph based on Gaze's variables uh, to publish this uh, knowledge graph. So thank you very much. This was my presentation and here you find the main outcomes of our project, the registration PID registration service. So we have the technical report and the use case and metadata schema extended report. Thank you very much. So this was my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm looking forward uh, to your questions. And please do not hesitate and contact me if you have any doubt or any feedback or any questions. Thank you very much.